All right. I see some attendings. Wendy's popping on. Here. Yeah, Adam and Dan have to be somewhere. Yeah. At, le at least one of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's Adam. There's Dan. Mm -hmm. Oh, what? Won't it let me? Oh. Oops. Okay, hopefully they should pop in here in a second. We're missing quite a few. Butch? Yeah, they're in the attendees section. Oh. I'm promoting them. How is everyone? Good. Good. Waiting How are for you, you? Dan? <laughs> We are live Good. and recording. Just FYI, we're live and recording. Oh, okay. So that, that's because of that last comment I said in the last. No, <laughs> no. I don't know. Zoom's not, the practice session isn't working. And so some people can't get in when I'm in practice session. I don't know why. My camera's not working, but I'm not that worried about it. But Nor are we. <laughs> for some reason, it's not working, and I'm too tired to figure out why. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry. You will not. All of you will not get to see my new cool haircut. Oh, you oh. got it. No, you got to go video, buddy. Yeah, figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah, it's it's awesome. All right, I think. I don't even know how to. Uh, I think we have everyone here. Uh, uh, task force member Ty did let me know that she's gonna be showing up a little late to the meeting. So if we could excuse her from the beginning, but she should be here around 6.30. So I think we have everyone mr chair whenever you're ready to start oh sorry i need i was downloading your all right i will call to order the meeting of the downtown community task force for november 18 2021 leslie please call roll member thompson here member Anderset. here Member Mayor. Here. Member Von Hume. Here. Member Vargas Smith. Here. Member Reed. Here. Member Coyne. Here. Member Ty. She did say again that she's going to be absent for the first part. And Member Vargene is also absent for the next few meetings. All right. Is there a motion to excuse or not to excuse Member Ty and Member Vargene? Or do I have to do them separate, Leslie? Uh, well, we could do them at once. Okay. Unless there's a chance you're going to not excuse them. <laughs> um, is there a second? Who is, my, who is my first and who's my second? Dan's first. I'll second. <laughs> Mayor. All in, yeah. favor of, all in favor of excusing Member Ty and Member Varshney from tonight's meeting, say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And the eyes carry, they are excused. Thank you. Um, Leslie, can you please read the DCTF meeting procedures into the record? Yes, thank you. Meetings are conducted by the chair in accordance with the following procedures. The chair of the DCTF directs all activity during the meeting. Any item on this agenda may be continued to a subsequent meeting. Special procedures time limits may be applied to any items as prescribed by the chair. Copies of the current agenda and staff reports for each of the items on the agenda are available online on the Downtown Precise Plan website, as well as on the City Clerk's website and at the City Clerk's office. Thank you, Leslie. We'll now move on to the consent calendar. There are no items on this evening's consent calendar. So do we still need to approve it? We do not. You can move on to general. Wait, we're moving on. Yeah, move quickly. All right, skip, skip that. Um, all right, so general, but so we'll move on to general business. Leslie, we please announce the first item. The first item on our agenda this evening is 
a recap of the preferred plan, height and massing, and development capacity. And we do have our consultants here this evening for this item and the next couple. I don't know, Jim, am I turning it to you or Peter? Uh, <clears throat> to me, thank you, Leslie. So yes, we wanted to just do a, a brief recap of what we went over in our last meeting, and then we wanted to get into um, uh, two other topics, placemaking and implementation. <clears throat> the um, That's what we want to spend the majority of the time on. So this first part is just a, a brief recap. Um, and then a little bit more time for items two and three. Um, actually, two and three together as the as an update on our our placemaking uh, strategy for the plan, and then uh, lastly talking a little bit about implementation. So um, things things are clipping along here, and we're starting the drafting process of the plan. So there's a lot of progress that we've been able to make with all of you. Uh, it's been great. It's, it's been such a productive dialogue with this group. And so we've got a lot of definition for the plan and we're able to start the drafting process. These last two pieces we need to put in place and, and we want to make sure that we have it right. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about placemaking, make, making sure that we've got all the components in here that, that's going to make this your downtown, that it's going to make this place unique. Uh, and then implementation, you know, there's, um, it, it's, it's a, a complex project. It's a complex undertaking. It's a large undertaking to rebuild a downtown. And we need to think about the implementation and, and what are the steps? And we want to get those right. We want to start off in the right way and then build the momentum uh, that's needed to carry this project forward. So, um, you know, lots to talk about tonight, but we want to um, clip through the first couple of items uh, pretty quickly and then get into some, some, some feedback on, on the the placemaking and the implementation. So for the recap of our last meeting, I'm going to turn it over to Peter and take it away, Peter Wench. Thanks, Jim. And um, good to be back uh, in this space. I uh, love this, um, this relationship um, and the, the work that you guys have all been doing. Um, so quick recap, building height and massing. Um, we we had a good session with you and I can't remember which, which month it was, but it was in the summer and we um, approved, um, you know, a framework plan with streets and public spaces, essential land use and urban form. And then since then we've been massaging it a little bit. It was, it was, it was approved by council in September um, with the refinement that we had made um, to address some of the, the concerns around sun and shadow. And um, subsequently, and, and in response to direction, both from, from this body and from council, um, we made a few further adjust, adjustments um, that were um, in response to the desire to maintain a good scale along Franklin Street um, and to appropriately respond to the historic resources and to the existing houses um, in the downtown area. So this diagram is showing the refined Basin bonus heights plan based on you know that 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 incorporates those um, those adjustments and you saw those last month. Um, specifically, um, it uh, steps down. Um, in fact, it changes to a, a, a lower scale, let's say, townhouse or live work format along the westernmost block of Franklin Street, um, and really um, takes care to step down to the to the existing houses, um, and then it also um, move some of the building volumes at the upper levels away from the post office to give a little bit more space to the scale of that special and lasting building. And uh, we can come back to that if there are questions, but we just wanted to, we haven't made any additional changes. We just wanted to, to sort of establish that that remains where we are um, with the building model. 
are there any questions on that before we before we leave that topic? Can you just go back to the image? I'm sorry. Uh, the one before. This is the along Madison, the 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 step down heights. Is that residential over commercial or is that either residential or commercial? Uh, we modeled this actually as residential. Um, I think it could be live work and when the plan could the plan could speak to that. Um, okay, no, that's fine. That's I just wasn't, wasn't clear about the colors. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, I think I'll, there was a lot of support for the live work component, um, Matthew. So um, that's something that I think we wanna integrate into the plan. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's a great idea. I think the track, track record right. of making it work is, is yeah decidedly mixed. So yeah. I had commented on that during the yep. meeting. I just wanted to make sure it didn't have a mandatory commercial or or uh, uh, use there because I would be afraid that would make those undevelopable sites. No. Yeah. yeah, and your comment was definitely noted. I think another component is we wanted to maintain land use flexibility. And that's something that kind of exists now, although there's a mix, sort of a mixture of plan development and office zoning right now, which is a little bit odd. But the existing houses there, part of our strategy to, um, to enable those to be successful um, in the longer term is to, is to provide land use flexibility. So if it wants to be a house, if, if, if a house is, is what the market demands, then that's that if it's an office or a restaurant, we would, we would want to be able to support that as well. The, just to be clear, I don't, my intent was not to constrain the potential. <laughs> it was yeah. just to make sure that we didn't constrain the potential. So I, I think that's, a, you know, it's a great idea. It might be a perfect location. It's just a real challenge. And so I wouldn't want it to be locked in in a way that, that made it that much more difficult. So I'm not opposed to live workspaces, that, that's all. So I had a, co I had a comment. Um, it's kind of what I brought about last time is that at the corner of Franklin and Monroe, it would be the Northeast um, that, you know, we basically along Monroe, you got the two historic houses at Homestead, then you go up to three stories then you go up to one, two, three, four, five. I felt like that three to five was kind of abrupt and uh, thought that maybe you go a little taller on the corner as kind of this marquee building at the corner that kind of, you know, signals Franklin, you know, as this major street. And, and then you can shed a little bit off of that five story next to three. That's kind of where my mindset was. Um, is this, this is the building where my cursor is? Yes, now. yes. So you, you take a little off of that and you put it on to the corner. Uh, there's, yeah, that's kind of what I thought. It's just the three to five, that's that transition, I guess, just um, that there's maybe a cleaner way you can integrate the, the facades along uh, Madison and not have such an abrupt, um, you know, transition. Yeah. So like a square portion it's, on the corner rather than a rectangle that kind of goes up one and that's more than that one story you've got there. And I wonder if you could take two of those off and so you go three, four, and then one more story on the corner. So yeah. from, from Homestead you go two, two, three, four, and then, you know, it sort of works its way up gradually and then really pops. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's yeah. just my, my comment. That's okay. a good comment. Okay, thank you. I have, I have a question because I'm looking at the um, block F, which is gonna be, what is that, um, Jackson and Homestead where you have the parking structure? Mm-hmm where University Plaza is. So how does that fit in? Because obviously the parking structure would serve a multitude of uh, you know, businesses and, and buildings. How does that 
get triggered and get completed? And do we need to have a plan at the parking structure? I mean, I know we have the two, right? So if, if it doesn't happen there, do we put in an alternative for, for that parcel to develop something? I mean, how does, how does that work? Cause like, let's say it doesn't go at the corner of Jackson and, you know, um, Jackson and Homestead, but it goes at the corner of Maine and Homestead or me, you know, how does that, how do we mark what is acceptable envelope wise in that location? I mean, should it mostly be just more what the, what the maximum height and size of a structure is in that location? And it's preferred to have a parking structure there, but that's still be adapted. So. I can take a shot at this and Jim, maybe if I, if I, if I miss, you can, you can yeah. be at the next. Yeah, next go ahead. Back. Um, what we're showing is a, is a condition where this block would develop with office uses. And so the way we've parked those office uses is to include a parking structure that would be a separate, uh, separate structure. It also would accommodate, um, as you can see, we're, we're showing this as a potential sort of second or backup location for performing community performing arts space. So that would also be parked in this garage. If instead this block were to develop residentially, I think we would expect it to have red parking integrated into the buildings. And so I think you're, you're right that we would need to set a building massing, building height um, expectation for this site because it wouldn't be expected to be a garage in that, in that, in that outcome. Does that make yeah, sense? I, I think that's right. The only thing I would add is that for the amount of office that we're trying to incentivize, and in fact, that we do regulate through our capping. So we cap the residential at a certain amount with the intent that the balance of the downtown development is in office. So the, the plan incentivizes roughly this amount of office, although it doesn't dictate these locations. And so what this plan is showing is that for this amount of office to, to park everybody, all the residential, the office and the community spaces, you're gonna need um, this level of public parking, right? These, this amount of parking garage. Um, they, the plan doesn't dictate that they go in these two precise places. And in fact, if office is placed in different blocks, the, the parking garage would probably wanna, wanna move with it. Um, there are certain things that we would want to achieve in building a parking garage that it doesn't front on Franklin, that it has a liner use on the side streets so that you're not, you know, you're not faced with a parking uh, garage on on those critical frontages, um, you know that the entries uh, happen in certain ways. That we have flat floor slabs to encourage the you know the potential for uh, reuse of these buildings later when we don't need as much space for parking. So I think it's it's a good point that you've brought up, and I think what we need to do is sort of have some objective standards here for. Um, that guide the the parking garages uh, to to meet certain criteria, but allow some flexibility in their locations. There's no other task force members with comments. We do need to go to the public on this item. Is there any other? DCTF members that like to comment before we move to public comment. All right, let's move to public comment. I need to open up that window so I can see. So there currently are no raised hands on this item. Okay. Is there anyone, is there anything in the chat? I don't, I don't know why, but my Zoom is very different okay. today. Uh, I don't I... see anything for chat. I can see the participants. Uh... I don't see any chat comments. So. Oh, my chat has disappeared as well. Okay. 
So it's not just me. Not just you. So is there anyone from the public, since we can't see the chats, I just want to make sure, there we go. Somebody raised their hand on the panel side. Uh, they put their hand no. down. Okay. All right, so since there's no comments from the public, just make sure if you do want to speak, please raise your hand since we can't see the chat. Apologize for that. Otherwise, we're going to move on. So item two okay. is community feedback on placemaking strategies. I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Diksha Rawat, to um, give a little overview of what, we, what we've learned from the community. Good evening, everyone. So um, in like the last few months, we've had an online survey and we've also done a community meeting. So we wanted to get back with the main points that we received from there after we analyzed that and we've used those as we move forward with our placemaking strategies and incorporated that into the rest of the presentation that you're going to see today. Um, from the online survey, like here are some of like the main snippets. So in terms of streets and plazas, the highest vote for everyone was going towards plazas and plazas that support festivals and farmers markets. The other thing that the community really wanted was wide streets with a lot of pedestrian amenities. And close um, third and fourth were having shared streets and also tree shaded like plazas. So those were some of the highlights. Apart from that, in terms of streets and public uh, plazas, we also heard that the streets should have a pedestrian focus. Um, that cars should be lesser and lesser priority in the downtown and pedestrian and bike facilities should be foremost. Um, there was a lot of conversation about whether we should close down Franklin Street or not, or whether there can be temporary closures. Um, so people were really excited about all of those elements. Moving forward, we had, we talked about um, which businesses and what kind of activities seemed attractive to people. And what we saw was that um, cafes and street side restaurants and outdoor dining was overwhelmingly the first choice that people wanted to see in the downtown. And I think we were all aware like that's going to be the most popular one. <laughs> um, but apart from that, uh, a recurring one was local businesses um, and encouraging that to come into downtown more than other things, but also having like a food hall and also outdoor concerts and movie events. So providing space for that in the placemaking section would be really important for us as we move forward. And the next one would be looking at how um, the buildings in terms of how the pedestrians are experiencing them on the ground floor should be. And the majority were talking about having a great indoor outdoor connection on the street level. So the environment should flow into each other. That also um, goes into two other options which got really good uh, ratings, which were having a generous ground floor height and having a lot of transparency in terms of like the store, storefront access, but also like just general transparency on the ground floor. Uh, people also really like the idea of having facade projections because that'll help create shade as well as create a more human scale on the ground floor. Uh, so those were some of the things people were excited about. And just summarizing on what other activities people liked, uh, people were really excited about arts and music in the downtown. Um, having anchor community uses, some said this could be like event spaces. Um, and the idea of uh, the theater evolving into a community event space and also having maybe a museum element <clears throat> in. So people had creative ideas like that in the online survey. Moving from that, we then had the community workshop that a lot of you were a part of. Um, and we had this inter interactive activity where everyone went into their own breakout groups. Um, and spoke about the five topics that we were discussing, uh, which were streets, public spaces, um, activation. 
we also talked about building articulation and art interpretation and wayfinding. So some of the key themes that we saw there were again, um, completing the street pattern uh, was spoken about by the community. And I think most importantly in those were Franklin Street and Main Street. Um, again, there was an emphasis over pedestrian priority. Um, the conversation about closing down Franklin Street went in a multitude of directions, but I think where we got the most consensus was having the ability to temporarily close down the street um, as and when events were being held because this helped with ADA access, uh, delivery vehicles, ride share pickup and drop offs. So that allowed like all sorts of users to be on Franklin Street, but also emphasizing pedestrians and bicyclists more than anything else. Um, there was interesting comments about station connectivity and maybe having a trolley or other micro mobility options that would enhance that connection. In terms of bike infrastructure, we talked about east-west connections as well as north-south connections going through the downtown that would be important for the overall citywide connectivity. Um, to the second topic, which was public space, um, we again spoke about activating with ample like outdoor cafes and restaurants. Um, there was the idea that there should be spaces for children in the downtown so that parents could hang out there for longer and maybe have these spaces next to coffee shops and restaurants where parents can keep like an eye on the children having music performance venues so that people can enjoy that in the downtown. Um, the idea that Lafayette was a good gateway into downtown and concentrating sound in that direction. Um, so especially like music and that kind of activities on that side instead. And having like ample tree canopies and shade in the downtown with the mature trees near the post office being preserved. And then in terms of talking about activation, um, putting in anchor uses, but also having um, non-chain rest uh, things. So people talked about having Trader Joe's, but also having local mom and pop restaurants or thinking about how we can balance both of these so that we're also emphasizing affordable retail in the downtown. And how do we design for that? Um, we wanted to continue the farmer's market that's happening and emphasize and build more infrastructure for things like that. And overall that they just wanted more kind of activating uses like bars, rooftop restaurants, art and wine festivals, bowling alleys, um, maybe history walks and things like that so that people can find uses in and like stay there for longer. With building articulation, there was like the general consensus that we didn't want cookie cutter architecture in the downtown, but there were like, which direction should we go to was a like interesting conversation. There was a lot of consensus towards the mission style architecture, but also doing modern architecture well and fitting that in with more historical architecture together to create a place which doesn't look like it was built completely today, but also not completely of the past. So that would be like a good mix for the downtown. And again, talking about transparency and creating a stimulating environment. So the facade increments should change um, pretty often so that the pedestrian still has something to look through while they're moving towards downtown and the use of paseos and arcades, which would help enhance the character. Lastly, everyone was very excited about art and celebrating art in the downtown with murals, um, installations, helping bring a sense of identity and representation of the past, not just of the downtown's past, but of Santa Clara's past and celebrating all kinds of users. Um, and people generally believe that the university has done a great job with their arts paseo and some, something like that should maybe extend into the downtown also. Um, there were ideas of using the buildings as interactive art with opportunities for lighting um, and using the alleys um, for interactive art, but an overall consensus that um, 
local artists should be invited to the downtown and potentially create affordable spaces for them. So those are the overarching themes that we heard both in the online survey and also in the community workshop that we conducted. And using all of these, we now move forward. Um, and I will give this back to Jim, who can talk about how we're condensing all of these down to the categories and what kind of like specific targeted strategies we can use for each of them. Great, thanks, Deeksha. <clears throat> so um, we're we're getting focused now. I think one of the things that really struck me about those uh interactive exercises with the community in the breakout rooms is we we kind of went from data collection and lists of kind of menus of strategies to something that started to gel into a more vivid picture of what the the downtown could be and that was a great moment for me it's, it's I could start to visualize it a little bit better because of the specificity of comments that we were getting from from the community and so I, I think that's something that we've we've been trying to embrace is how do we move from the data to the experience and and what is this experience really about uh, so that it's it really feels right for Santa Clara and and for you know for for your community. So we wanted to do just a little uh, just change it up a little bit here. Do a little bit of an exercise to try to bring all of you into that experiential world. So uh, I just want to stop sharing uh, for a moment. And if we can all see each other for a second here. And if everyone can join hands, okay, we can't do that. Uh, but seriously, if everyone can close your eyes and we want to do some imagining here. So it's, it's 20 years from now, okay? And this the development of this downtown has really progressed much more rapidly than, than, than what we had hoped. It's exceeded our expectations. And the, the first phase happened very quickly. And, and then that, as was our hope, that incentivized other property owners and developers to get on board and, and, and um, you know, get in on this on this amazing energy. And so now you're getting off the train at Santa Clara Station and you make your way down the Paseo through the university, which, um, you know, has developed their arts Paseo even more. Their trees are mature, it's shady. There's a nice breeze with, um, you know, with the smell of jasmine. Uh, maybe um, I don't want to imagine this for you, so I'm just I'm just the guy that's setting it up, and you and you go through the Paseo, and then you get to Lafayette, you cross the street, and you enter into that first block of Franklin with our with our plaza on the right, and it's it's amazing. It it really exceeds your expectations. It, it's all you had hoped for and more and and what do you see and what do you hear so i want each of you just to imagine that what do you see and what do you hear and just hold that experience and maybe just write a cup jot down a couple of notes to yourself so you don't forget that sort of the key aspect of of what you're experiencing Okay, does everybody kind of have that image? Okay, so hold on to that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a, an example experience up here. And then I wanna have each of you or any of you that, that wanna share, add to that, modify it based on the experience that, that you just imagined. 
Okay. So let's go back to the let's go back to the screen and let's flip to the next slide. So I'm there standing there and I close my eyes. I hear kids laughing. Outdoor diners are clinking their glasses and silverware, and talking, and a soft sound of flowing water is in the background and there's music in the air. And then I open my eyes, I see a rich tapestry of mural art, greenery, textured plazas, sidewalks and storefronts dappled with shade and buzzing with activity, pedestrians and bicycles flowing and not too many cars. And then that leads, we can come back to this, but let's go to the next slide. That leads to, okay, if that's what I experienced, then, then how would we articulate a vision for, and this is just for placemaking, right? So how do we articulate a vision for placemaking? Santa Clara's downtown is a strong expression of this community. Music, art, and historic themes should be binding threads of one's experience. Downtown is activated by everyday activities like outdoor cafes, shopping, play areas, water elements, and active mobility combined with ephemeral activities like farmer's market, music, food, and art festivals, and mobile activators like food trucks and a bookmobile. Downtown should feel comfortable, shady, safe, and active with lots of street trees, places to sit and comfortable spaces for kids and seniors alike. So that's just sort of a sample vision statement about, about the placemaking. So let's maybe toggle back and forth between these two. Let's go back to the first one. And if, if you guys could share what you experienced when, when we just did that and, and what, we, what we can add to this. Or modify. And who wants to go first? I'm I'm looking at Deborah. So can I call on you? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. One thing uh, when I closed my eyes, I was thinking of also seeing just at that first plaza by Lafayette um, some kind of marquee that would tell me what to look forward to on the weekend or why I should come back. You know, whether it's the movie or something at the performing arts theater, something that tells me, um, you know, what else is going to be happening in the future. Great. Anything else, Deborah, that was happening before your eyes? <laughs> Other than that, I, I really think you nailed it. I think the kids laughing, the outdoor dining, and it's just a very vibrant place. I'll add a little something in. Can I go? Yep. Go yeah, ahead. Brian. I, I envisioned being swept up with the movement of people along the Paseo flooding into the downtown. And there was a line wrapped around the building because there was an opening for a movie or, or a performance. So there was a buzz. And I get the similar feeling going to the Santa Clara University of women's soccer that, you know, when I went on campus and, and it was just a really fun experience. So there's a buzz. Uh, Plaza's got sun in it. People are enjoying and laughing, similar to what you said. Um, but that there's an event and there's a movement of people pulling you along. So that's what I would add. Great. Love it. Can I jump in? Yep. So I imagine it a little differently. I imagine that I'm coming down the Arts Paseo and that's where some of the excitement and energy and vibrancy is coming through. And as you cross Lafayette, you feel the connection between what's happening on one side of the street to the other side of the street. And as I'm actually walking down to the university, I'm able to look down through the downtown and start observing, feeling the excitement and energy that's across the street. So it doesn't become this walk up to Lafayette Street, oh, here's downtown, let's cross the street and start the experience. How do we make, not only from the university side, 
but all around the downtown that that as you approach it from from Monroe or other areas, that energy starts pulsating and you start feeling that something is happening there. So that's how I visioned it as I as I close my eyes and and approach this new downtown. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the the the, the university is not just the quiet, shady in between place. It's where the experience begins, and then it continues as you go into the downtown. I would imagine I would be looking for history because I'm a history geek, and I love some of the oldest cities I've traveled to in Europe. That's one of the first things I want to know about the place is why is this called a Gothic neighborhood? You know, what I'm looking for churches, I'm looking for statues, I'm looking for art that's telling me a story about the place. So history is very important to me. Um, right now you can walk into Santa Clara and really not understand how old it is. Or you, you see 70s buildings, you know, you see things without a personality, you see beige buildings. You don't see anything that says, I've been here a long time. And, and the town has been there a long time, but so much of that was wiped away. If we can bring back, I mean, so few people know that JJ Montgomery was a professor at the university. He was the father of glider flight. You know, things like that, that happened in our town. Jack London wrote his first chapter of Call of the Wild. You know, why can't we have a something that symbolizes uh, Santa Clara being that first chapter? You know, things like that, that I wanna know that give the town a personality. Everything you described was beautiful, but I think um, more, more history too, yeah. really give it roots. Yeah, really bring out the history layer that wants to be really legible in this experience. And there's, a number of ways then that can happen but let's let's figure out some of those ways and and um you know build that into the plan so that as phases happen people sort of have uh some guidance into the different ways that that history can be brought out and wayfinding signage is very important to me i like to know where i'm going uh because i I'm kind of self-guided when I travel. And um, so having, whether it's a, a kiosk or um, even the signs themselves on the street corners that indicate that this is an old neighborhood. I saw an image of, a, I think it was Boston. Some of the signage there will say, uh, uh, reflect some of the heroes that lived on that street. I thought that was kind of cool, you know, as you're walking around that somebody that everyone knew lived here, you know? Uh, those kind of signage, it can tell you what the street is, but maybe have something else to it that tells a story about that block. It would be lovely. Great. Okay, I could go, I think. So um, what I, I concur with, with Butch that, you know, as, as the trolley or, or whatever is, is people moving goes, goes through Santa Clara, that there is not this stark, you know, Santa Clara ends, the university ends, and then downtown begins. Um, but as you cross Lafayette, what I saw was that open market that we've talked about, that, that you know, smaller building to the right, um, and the smell of the food cooking in there, uh, the, the people gathered around that, that space. I think we talked about an open space with a lot of seating there, so, so you have a mixture of people sitting and enjoying uh, coffee or a cocktail, um, you know, kids playing on the lawn there in that in that quad area to the right. And then this is no surprise to anybody on the dais that uh, as I look to the left, I see, you know, kind of what Anna talked about, which is the history um, of Santa Clara, which is that that neon sign that I keep talking about. So you look up and you see that that vertical and gold and and red that says Santa Clara and to Deborah's point underneath the marquee that you know could announce the movie that's inside of it or the movies that are inside of it or you know uh, public public uh, events that are coming up and what have you and that that's really what I see in in blocks you know a and b and I think in you know my portion on number four, that's what we're going to be talking about with C, D, E, and F. But as you enter, that's what I see is 
you really want that wow factor that that you don't see in any other downtown and um yeah so that's that's what i got great that's <clears throat> that's excellent okay uh did we miss anyone uh leslie would you like to share any thoughts don't want to exclude you no i will leave it to the <laughs> task force members okay Come on, Leslie. <laughs> you right. i see i see all the things oh, that you adam, guys have adam we haven't seen. we haven't heard from adam yet no i think you're uh or matthew your your explanation was great and uh you know, I'll be honest, the only thing I'd be looking for is a bench to sit down and enjoy and take it all in, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, by that time, I'll pro probably be pretty tired. Um, but no, I, you know, to that point, though, I think it'd be really good to make sure that there are places and niches to be able to sit and people watch. I like to people watch, and I also like, you know, to be able to have interactions without having to have a formal setting like you know, uh, you know, I don't want to have to be a patron of a restaurant just to get a seat somewhere. And so I think if you make those kind of places and San, we, I know we've talked about it, so I won't rehash it, but the Santana Row out by Mary uh, Maggiano's, that place is always lively and activated because it's just available. There's seating, there's places to hang out and uh, be seen and see others. So I think that's really just make sure that those places are, are um, available and not just be having to be a patron or a resident. Great. That's essentially what I was going to say, Adam. You and I should hang out more. Um, we can't because of the Brown Act. So. Yeah, I know. I know. You guys need to find a bench to sit on. No, I really, I, it was benches and it was somehow intimate and yet open in that space. Um, and I'll be honest, I had that like twilighty light. <laughs> so I don't know why, but it, it was it was right at that time when the sun was kind of, you know, early evening summer. Um, so yeah, thank you for taking us there. And I'm 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 pleased to hear all of all of what folks had. I think that's a great vision. Okay. Great. Thank you, Matthew and Adam. Um, those are those are really good thoughts. And just to let everyone know, um, Chan has joined the meeting. So I don't know. I didn't quite see how much she's heard of this. So I don't know if she wants a chance to speak or just to listen for right now. Yeah, I, I joined right as people were sharing. I'm okay. catching on that maybe it's like, what do we imagine we want to see in the downtown space? Yes, exactly. What, yeah, what do you see when you close your eyes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's echoing what half of the people I heard are saying is places to sit, places to people watch lots of different kinds of activities that could happen. Um, potentially people eating outside, potentially um, an event happening where people are listening to a performer. Um, but I was just in downtown Paso Robles and also in downtown Sunnyvale. So I think those images are popping into my mind where it's walkable, there's a park, there's green space. But I think this idea of different kinds of mixed activities that appeal to lots of different community members is what I would say. Awesome. Okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna run through just a, a really rough strategy and this is definitely a work in progress. And I think it captures some of the things that, that you guys have said um but yeah tell us what's missing okay as we walk through these so we broke down the place making strategy into four categories the first one is streets and public space so it's pedestrian priority the sidewalks are wide there's opportunities for a variety of street closures to accommodate different activities uh, mobility options abound scooter bike bike share trolley um, some cars, but, um, you know, limited uh, and not dominating the scene. Uh, play areas for kids, music venues, so both informal and maybe slightly formal, uh, tree canopies, lots of shade, uh, ample seating, um, upper level public spaces, so um, privately owned 
public open space like roof decks, but also just second level terraces. You know, there may be a, a cafe or a restaurant that has a second level terrace. So you can sit up there um, and look down over, over the plaza, over the street. So those are some ideas for streets and, and public space. Why don't I go rattle through all four and then we can come back to each and, and take some additional comments and input for activation and programming. And some of these things overlap and that, that's okay. Um, active frontages with cafes, restaurants and shopping is just, yeah, that's no brainer. To, everyone has said that uh, from the community to yourselves. And so that's something that's going to be really critical. Um, mobile activators. Um, that's just a, a word, a phrase we made up uh, to encompass food trucks and uh, mobile library, bookmobile, and, and other things. You know, there are these interesting pods that are showing up, like the Parks and Rec Department has a little pod that they can come and, and promote their parks uh, and things like that. So getting creative with those little mobile activators that, that can come and go. Uh, water elements, so we heard this, they need to be sustainable, right? We don't wanna be gushing water and wasting water. Mm -hmm. We want that water element uh, to be you know, visible and audible you know, in these different spaces. Uh, events, farmer's market, music festivals, art, wine, and food festivals. So all of those things. And then the next category is the, the um, art interpretation and wayfinding. So, you know, to Anna's point, how do we really express history? And, you know, let's look in all the different ways that that can be done. I think, you know, interpretive signs is is one way, but I think there's a lot of other sort of bold and creative ways that that can be done. Uh, murals that express historic themes, that express Native American themes, uh, express the historic downtown, uh, the, the, the whole mission uh, culture of, of this region. So how can we really do that? And, you know, just a little side, tangent to that, we've requested more of the archival photos from the downtown. I think Leslie put that request out there. Um, <clears throat> so we're looking forward to receiving everything we can, but we started looking at our own uh, collection of historic images that we've been able to uh, assemble to date. And, you know, just really looking at what what are the takeaways? And I think some of the comments in our last meeting about pulling elements from the historic downtown really resonated with us, you know, without overdoing it, how can you bring a facade element, a storefront element, you know, the marquee is an obvious one and bring those in as, as sort of special uh, accents that, that appear and are part of that, the architectural mix that, um, you know, the Diksha described earlier. Um, so I think we'd like to get into a little bit more detail on that um, before all is said and done and, and build that into the plan. So yeah, all these themes to express, sorry, just click back one for a second. Um, I think I said them all. The, oh yeah, the diverse culture of today. You know, it's not all about history. It's about what's today's culture. What are the, what are the mix of, of ethnicities and cultures that you have in the community today and, and how can those be expressed? Uh, extending the university's art paseo, uh, engaging with local artists is a great way to be genuine is to express these local themes with local artists. It's just a really powerful tool. Uh, and then subtle yet inviting wayfinding system. Again, uh, Anna had mentioned that. And then moving on to the last category, um, the building articulation. And I think we're definitely starting to hear recurring themes here. And a lot of this can be built in to the, um, um, you know, to the, to the standards, the form-based code. Um, architecture should be well-designed, 
you know, first and foremost, regardless of what historical reference or modern or or mission or Spanish revival, it should be well done and be a blend of Spanish mission revival and contemporary and perhaps with some of these, you know, sort of special historic uh, insertions here and there done in a you know, really interesting and, and tasteful way. Um, taking inspiration from, from the historic downtown, uh, transparent ground floors, lots of visibility, lots of activation by those ground floor spaces, and then express vertical facade increments to break down the scale. So I think, you know, that's really a, a refrain. Everyone is, is on board with that, and we need to make sure that that's built into the um, to the guidelines and the standards. And then this whole notion of the galleries and the arcades and the setbacks, um, I think that's really resonating with people. It really adds an organic quality, you know, not doing that, uh, you know, everywhere on all frontages, but just inserting those facade projections, those galleries, those arcades, uh, in strategic places and using that as a way to add to, um, you know, add to the, the variety and, um, and the, um, the character of, of the downtown to add to the experience. So those are sort of the, the four main categories and trying to be the, the distilled essence of elements that we want to make sure that we're getting into the placemaking strategy. Um, so this is this is sort of, well, I guess before we go here, or yeah, maybe maybe I can just go ahead and complete this segment and then we can come back to any of it that, um, that people have comments on. Um, so this is saying, okay, with all those elements in mind, let's make sure that we're, we're covering, you know, we're not just thinking, for example, about Lafayette Gateway on the East End, but let's make sure that we're getting the right combination of these different placemaking strategies throughout the downtown. So, you know, in the plazas, but also in the street frontages and, you know, historical references in the right place, the movie theater, the marquee is one thing, the post office, the preservation of the post office is another. And, um, you know, so making sure we've got a good distribution of these strategies um, but in a way that, um, you know, is strategic and makes sense. Different things are going together with each other in the right way. And in the next slide, then looking at that in a little bit more fine grain in each of our main spaces. So if the, if the top photo is, you know, the representative experience up in Franklin Square, it's a little more quiet, a little more shady. The, you know, the post office is sort of the feature uh, element there. Uh, and then coming back to the central grove in the center photo, it's, it's a shady place, but it's active. You know, there are things going on here. There's music, there's play areas for kids, there's outdoor dining around the perimeter. And then in the Lafayette Gateway in the lower photo, we've got the food hall, which is sort of right at the gateway. Um, but then we've got other activating things happening around the plaza, the, the theater, um, outdoor dining, the, the uh, community center, uh, performing arts, um, the ability for, um, you know, music uh, performances to set up. Um, so each of those have their own character. So just going, zooming in, to a little bit more detail on those. And again, these are, these are works in progress, but we're just trying to use this as a way of saying, have we, you know, have we captured everything and are these things occurring in the right combinations with each other? So here you can see, um, you know, in the immediate foreground, the food hall, and this is, um, this is cutting through the food hall and and the theater on one side and the and the uh, retail space on the other side, just to show how those ground floor uses are interacting with the public space. Um, so you know the food hall is obviously a, a prominent 
in a prominent position, but it's also generating a lot of activation. People are going in and out of that, and there's outdoor dining, you know, all around it. Um, the plaza itself can be used for just a wide variety of different things. We can have movie night. Uh, we can have uh, musical performances set up, but in the everyday usage, um, it's got outdoor dining, and that can go almost around the entire perimeter. Uh, the movie theater on the left integrated into a mixed use building, uh, and then Franklin Street itself uh, activated by um, restaurants and cafes, but also shops, um, the ability to bring uh, tables and chairs out on, not only out onto the sidewalk, but out into, uh, into parklets. Uh, so this is, you know, this is, oh, oh, and also just looking for places for mural art, right? These can be really strong expressions of um, some of the cultural themes that we referred to. So, you know, we need some blank walls in, you know, someplace and these little alley entrances might be a really good place to do that. They could, they could announce the entrance to the alley, but they could also be, you know, this place for, for public art. And then let's flip to the next space. So this is actually flipping to the other end now. This is on the Franklin uh, Square end. So you can see uh, the post office here. There's a uh, farmer's market in place. The fountain is actually relocated in this configuration. So it moves off to a, a park slash plaza space to the north of, of Franklin. Um, you've got uh, activating uses on the, on the ground floor of the buildings that are facing this space, uh, outdoor dining, um, and then the plaza itself can be used for a variety, again, for a variety of uses. You can have a kid's play area. Uh, you can have a place for, um, for musical performances to be set up. And then in the last one, this is the, uh, the Central Grove. So this is looking south towards uh, Park Central and the library. And so you can see the, the Grove spaces in the foreground, uh, flanking both sides of Franklin, uh, kids play area in the park, uh, again, accommodating uh, places for musical performances, um, outdoor dining, um, and then the, the street frontage itself is activated by micro mobility um, offerings, uh, bike share, scooters, the trolley itself. Uh, so, you know, all of those things are, are activating the street. And then Main Street, which is running north south, is this sort of gracious promenade. It's a, it's a wider sidewalk. It's a double row of shade trees, and it's leading you to the park uh, and to the library. So it's sort of a, a, a special announcement of this important crossroads. So again, these are works in progress. We want to keep refining these and adding to them. Uh, so we'd love comments on these, and then these, I think, will find their way into the plan where we can start getting some of that specificity in terms of, of these strategies. So feel free to comment. We can flip back to any of th those materials that, that anyone wants us to. I had a question about lighting. Um, one of the downsides of our current downtown, and many of the Santa Clara U students say they don't like how dark and uh, doesn't feel safe, uh, doesn't feel festive. I mean, I've traveled in, in Europe during the holidays and they've got the lights strewn across the streets and everything's so illuminated and lit up. But um, how do we sustain something like that, like on a regular basis, um, as opposed to just street lamps? I mean, to create that sense of, wonder and festivity and this is where I want to walk because it's bright and it feels safe and this is this is looks magical and yeah um, yeah great point so um 
I think we do want to have some infrastructure in place. So, you know, there can be a base level of permanent lighting that I think just brings safety and brings a little bit of drama. You know, maybe there's some um, accent lighting in the water features and, and things like that. But then I think there is this other layer that you're describing, which is more seasonal, maybe associated with certain uh, holidays or certain festivals. And I think we want to have the infrastructure in place where you can just plug and play. You don't have to be stringing extension cords across the sidewalk and things like that. And the, the same is true for accommodating food trucks and musical events. You don't want people running generators out there. You want to have some outlets in place where food trucks can plug in, musical um, performances can plug their equipment in. So I think definitely thinking about that infrastructure and, and having that in the in the public space development standards is going to be important. Jim. I'm glad, Anna, thanks for bringing it up. I'm glad we were talking about because we've lost a little bit of stuff because we talked about so many things, right? And so I think pop-up shops and food trucks and everything, having those utilities in is going to be really important, especially as retail kind of reemerges from COVID. Smaller spaces are key, um, you know, and especially to have basically like a traveling um, retail opportunity so stores don't have to come in. Specialty stores can come in for short periods of time. I know one of my friends who is an e-bike retailer in the area, he's considered doing, um, you know, pop-up shops at different locations uh, throughout the year. So that way he can move and capitalize on a specific market. Is there a way to identify an area and, um, you know, get those inf that infrastructure needed in? And then the other, I have one other thing, which is what about public restrooms? That's something I don't think we've ever brought in, but I mean, as part of the parking structure, I would think at a bare minimum, but I mean, a lot of restaurants, especially during COVID, you know, they closed them down. I mean, even still some restaurant, uh, some restaurants are still closed down. So I think, you know, the parks were all closed. So, I mean, I would walk my daughter and it was very difficult to use the restroom in places. You'd have to be very calculative. So something to think about. Yeah, no, really good point. I think we have neglected it. Uh, Adam, so let us give some thought to that, because I don't think you want to rely totally on private businesses, uh, but you do want them to be, um, you know, accessible. You want, you know, enough of a frequency where you're not, you know, walking three blocks to the to the parking garage restroom. So I think uh, that's a really good point. Let us give some thought to that. You know, in downtown San Jose has the the French style toilets along the street that are nice to look at and functional. I don't know if they're happy with them since they've been put in, but that's a, a great asset to, that could be added to. Yeah. I, I, I had some comments. Can you go back to the very first one, Jim? Yep. First, uh, I've been thinking about this for a while. Uh, go back there, that one. Nope, nope, nope. Go forward. The overall view. The overall view. And in looking at this, I know this is, we're looking at it and developers are going to decide what to do. And, and we're really looking at the 30,000 foot level and building heights. And, and I, every time we, we pull this up, something in the back of my head keeps going. There's, there's something not right about it. And I couldn't put my finger on it for the longest time. And then last week I, I was in downtown San Jose. So I went through downtown Dan San Jose. I came in through 280, got on to 87 and looked at all the construction that's happening in downtown San Jose. And it finally hit me. It's the buildings in downtown San Jose, although they have some character to it, they're all very square, boxy and linear. And as I look at our downtown, I see the same thing. Here's a lot of boxes that are that are either parallel or perpendicular that that you know I, I, we've brought it up before you brought it up today too about these nice little alleyways and things like that. So part of me looking at this is I keep seeing tunnels 
And as I visioned coming up from Santa Clara up the Paseo, the first image I had was looking down this long block of building after building after building, all facing the same way, all the same height with, and, and then I started thinking, boy, this, the way the buildings are arranged so symmetrically, it's a lot like Santana Row or other places I have been. And, and the other thing that made me think a little bit more about this was Anna, your comments about the history and, and, and the, old play, the old downtown and some of those elements that go along with it. So I guess my question is, once we put this together, will the developers have the opportunity to maybe not put everything so square on a block, they can change it at a diagonal, do some creativity, do some of those things? Um, or are they gonna pretty much be told this is how it needs to be. Um, I think of buildings like the Chrysler building in New York, you know, with the, with the tower on top and the lights and things like that, that, that really make that dynamic. And I wanna make sure that we just don't build this blocky square, you know, it's got nice facades, but you walk up, take a direct left or right, take, go up a block left, right. There's some organic feeling to it you know, cross, yeah. cross through across cross section. Does that make, I don't know if that's making any yeah, sense or not. Yeah, that, but... that, that makes very much sense, Butch. And so a couple comments on that. First of all, these, um, these bulk uh, diagrams, these 3D bulk diagrams are a little bit dangerous because they convey this blocky look that you're referring to. But just think of this as a, as a 3D diagram that is simply trying to communicate building height envelopes, right? So these are the envelopes within which actual buildings will be shaped, but the, the shape of the building will be much more varied and articulated. Um, so that's comment one. So how do we do that? Have, have you driven downtown San Jose recently? There's yes. like eight or nine high rise buildings going up. And if you kind of squint, they all look the same. They're all just tall square buildings going up. And maybe we put a little bit of diagonal on the window or something. But the more I look at downtown, because I, I was actively involved in the development of downtown for, for a decade or more. And part of the things we said when we wanted to build that is we didn't want what's happening right now. And what it is, is developers are coming in, let's throw up 20 story buildings, let's square them up, let's make them, there's no character, there's no, so part of it is, is in this plan, we need, and we are, I know we are, I'm not saying that we're not, we just need to make sure that this, this downtown has character, that going back to Anna's comments, what makes San, Santa Clara unique, is it the history, is it the design, whatever, but I want people to come into downtown Santa Clara and say, this is something I haven't experienced before, this makes Santa Clara, the city of Santa Clara, a little bit unique. Yeah, I totally agree, Butch. And I think we do have tools that will be integrated into the plan, into the form-based code that will ensure this kind of natural variety, right? It it wants to it wants to vary. It doesn't want to be cookie cutter. All the things that we've talked about, we need to build into the to the guiding regulations of the of the plan. So it's, I think we're all on the same page and, and committed to that. We just need to make sure that that reads the way that, uh, that we all want it to in, in the, the final outcome. Um, so yes, to all of that. I think one other point to make that, I've, that I think is, is just sort of naturally providing a variation is all the, the manipulation we've done to this massing diagram, you know, over the past year that that Peter Winch referred to in his intro, you know, we've we've done pass after pass after pass, and each time responding to neighborhood adjacencies, responding to sun and shade um, issues, responding to the scale of the historic homes on the uh, on the west end there. And I think the outcome of that is a, a variation that you're starting to see uh, between blocks and between block faces that are all there for a reason, but the, the outcome is that there is this variability. So, you know, even though this is just a blocky 
massing diagram, it does start to ensure that there's gonna be some height and mass variation. And then if we can bring that other layer that you're talking about in terms of how these buildings are shaped and articulated within that envelope, then I think we've we've achieved um, you know what what you're saying. Yeah, and again, if you go back to the Franklin Street entrance one, we have talked about the building facades, changing it, all those pieces which are fine, and give each building character. But there's still that every building is flat up against the street, straight on. Yeah. Put, yeah, just look down, look down the block. It's block after, you know. And again, they can all have different facades in front, but you still have that blockiness, even if they have different character for character traits for each other, one of the buildings. So, yeah, I, just my thoughts. I'm sorry. Yeah, point taken. I appreciate that. Uh, other comments on this piece looks like Matthew and Deborah. Yes, um, I was actually going to follow on on something that that Butch had said. Um, I know that you know we're we're kind of designating how many heights uh, a build, uh, how many floors a building might be, and um, you know diminishing heights towards the street and things like that that are going to be in our uh, in our um, plan. But ultimately. A, de a developer is going to, you know, purchase the property and um, engage their own architect and start building something that makes sense for them. So I think the, the question really is, how do we make sure that we've got the kind of language that we want in the pre precise plan and the form based code to keep our vision, um, you know, alive through the whole development process? Is that rhetorical or are you actually asking? I'm actually asking, how do we make sure that a developer comes in and doesn't build, you know, um, big blocky buildings? Well, I think we do that in every way we can, in, in every tool we have at our disposal. So it's, it's this plan, the way we describe the intent, it's the form-based code, in the way it regulates that intent. Um, and I think that can go a long way. Um, but developers are smart and, and I mean that in a good way. Um, and, you know, they're also expert at sometimes circumventing regulation. So I think the, the final arbiter is, is design review process and this, the city, the community will have that opportunity also to review plans and to, um, you know, make sure that uh, that you're you're getting what's what's intended. So I think we use all the tools at our disposal. Okay, okay, yeah. Just wanted to you know um, make sure that we're covering everything that we can um, at this phase. And and as he said, when a, a developer comes in with an architect or uh, drawing. Um, the community will have an opportunity for feedback at that point as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, thanks. Matthew. You know, Rob's hand was up first. I'm more than willing to jump in, but I was watching the screen. Rob, you wanna jump in? Sure. Thank you, Matthew. Um, can I share my screen real quick? Is that possible, uh, Jim? Yep. Okay. So uh, there's a great website called CaliSphere, and it's an archival website with photos from all over uh, the place. And I came across this great, um, let's see here. Can you see this Whidbey building yep. here? Yep. I believe that's on Franklin Street, Santa Clara. So. I'm going to talk about mission style and architecture first. This is a building that was in our downtown. Um, I think it's important for residents, committee members, everybody involved with this, that as much as we are the mission city, our downtown wasn't the mission. Yeah. Okay. And so it, it, 
it frustrates me as an architect um, because a lot of times it's scale. And this is something that we have to contend with is that scale and proportion has to be translatable. A style has to be able to translate by scale. Okay. So if we're looking at this building, that building can scale, right? That design is fairly straightforward. It's a two story brick building. Um, you can build that and then step back and step up or just step up and change the texture above it, right? You could stucco above it or you could do, but it's really important, you know, to understand what the soul of our downtown was. And it wasn't mission style, okay? Thank if you. There, there, there are some colonial revival and span, you know, there are elements of that, but you're not gonna see, well, you know, so it, I think it's really important to understand that. Okay, so I'll get off of this share. Um, and then, so the other thing I wanna talk about is the scale and proportion in that plaza. I don't want this plaza, and it's kind of what Anna was saying about how intimacy is super important with our town. And that plaza, and I know it's just the first go, but I don't want it to be like San Francisco in front of City Hall and, you know, th those are dead and then they demonstrate, right? I mean, it, it's, it's there, I go to those places and I'm like, eh, you know, <laughs> and I leave. It, that, that's not our downtown, but it's super important that it's maybe a hair smaller than we want it to create that intimacy and the end. And because if it's too big, I, I feel like it's, it's, uh, I don't know, it's not intimate. And so the one that Adam brought about Santana Row, that obviously could be bigger, but it's always crowded. So it's super important that it's got that energy and it's not a wasteland. Okay. So scalability is super important. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was the, the trees. Um, people like shade, I get it, you know, um, but we were on a gateway crossings park thing last night and everybody wanted trees and a bunch of shade. And I honestly think the landscape architect was a little shocked at how much shade people wanted in the park. Um, and so I'm also worried about this grove thing and, and the two sets of trees going down and feeling like, you know, shading the Western exposure is super important, I think, for the businesses and the sidewalk, but the buildings are going to provide quite a bit of shade in certain areas too. I just don't want these trees, and I love trees, don't get me wrong, but I also want that park to be a... a, a a magnet because if people want the shade at the park and they want to be that they have that, you know, they can go there. So I'm just worried. I, I think we've talked about this before of the double row of trees. And, and I'm just worried that, you know, too many, I hate to say too many trees, but it's just gotta be, uh, we just want to make sure we're smart about it. Um, and and then the last thing I'll say is, you know, you guys are the experts. And I said this at the, the, the park meeting last night. I said, you get a lot of feedback from citizens and residents and architects that are residents and historic people that are, but you're the experts. You deal with a lot of cities. And so we're leaning on you to really guide us with these nuances, you know, because you can ask a thousand people what they like but it's piecemeal and it may not understand the context and the scale. Um, it's too easy to do it that way. I, I see it all the time when I do with my clients, you know, so I, I always, my frustration with my clients is saying, you know, do you ever ask the architect what he thinks is best? <laughs> you know, I mean, you have all these ideas and you send me these things and I, I mean, you're hiring a trained professional. So I, I, I guess that's a little, and I don't want to, it's a frustration for me dealing with process as a planning commissioner and doing things that things tend to get watered down because everybody has an opinion, but that's why you hire very skilled and people that are great at what they do. And I believe that's you guys. So I'm happy about that, but I, I want you guys to really interject uh, your force in terms of this stuff. Okay, I'll stop talking. <laughs> so thank you. Well said, Rob, well said.
Great points. Okay, now Matthew. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's always nice when somebody smarter than you steals your thunder. So I literally have Civic Center, San Francisco, written <laughs> down, trees written down. And and so I want to echo the the um Rob's comment and um the second part. <laughs> Not, not the architecture part, I'll leave that to him. Um, I think, and I, I don't know if this is like coming late and saying, oh, we were supposed to wear suits or something, because I feel like we have talked about this a lot, but I was really also struck by the scale of the plazas. And in each case, you know, one, two, three, and then the, the, um, the library, we were talking about how we could hold live music or you know a, a large scale gathering and i was thinking i don't know if we need four places <laughs> to do that in our downtown and i think there's something very attractive about a space that has a kind of a functionality of scale but i think to rob's point sometimes we you know we lose the daily intimacy of those spaces in the process. And so that was kind of my sense was that there was some redundancy of that, that goal to have a, a large enough scale plaza or open space to be able to accommodate stuff that I think we want, but I'm not sure we, so, but then, you know, part of that was also the openness of those spaces. And so, you know, again, you guys are smarter than I am, but I'm wondering, if there's, you know, lower kind of density, shorter uses of, of the, the kind of boundaries around those spaces that activates, takes up more space. Maybe it's a single story restaurant layer or something that's kind of around the front of those buildings so that the space still feels open, but it doesn't feel empty. Um, so I had this one story I've been waiting to tell this group because I've told it before. One of the most depressing things that I've seen in years is in City Hall in Mountain View. It's this beautiful plaza. It has a fountain. It has steps. It, you know, it's just clearly well thought out. Nobody's ever there. And at one point they had this little, they had a, they rolled out a, like a 10 by 12 piece of fake grass and they set up, you know, uh, Adirondack chairs. And there were people sitting in the, like it was this fake intimacy in the middle of this plaza that wasn't working. And I was thinking, wow, man, if I was the architect of this place, that would be totally destroy me because you know, they were able to create with fake grass and two chairs what had been missing from that space from the very beginning. And so, you know, I think you can uh, you can kind of create divisions in the space so there are intimacies in pockets and, and create intimacy in a large space, but I think it's worth reflecting on the kind of redundancy of the scale that I think we've asked you for. I, I don't think you you did this without our input. I'm just wondering now if if we've we've thought that through fully. So I will leave it at that. Rob said it better than I did, but thank you for letting me share my story about Mountain View because I've been waiting for that. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. You know, I've been practicing for whatever it is, 40 years, and um, in dealing with this issue of scale, and it's super tricky. Scale always tricks you. And just when you think you've got it right, then, you know, it's built and it's like, oh my God, that is way smaller than I had imagined it or the opposite happens. And so, you know, I think all we can do at this stage of, of the process is to keep iterating it, keep testing it. And so I think these comments are really good because it makes us go back and say, did we get it right? Let's look at that again. And, um, and and let's get it right. So that's one thought. Um, 
we we definitely want to get it right, uh, especially in the first move, because that first space needs to be super successful because it's our catalyst, you know, for the whole downtown. Um, the other thought I had is, you know, at a certain size, there's a there's a natural ability to integrate more green space into the plaza and i'm wondering if in the central park ones the the larger squares on the north side if those really do want to be more green dominated because that really is the thing that's been missing in all of this is green space and i think you you can't have enough green space there isn't any too big you know once you make it green because it gets it gets used, it gets utilized. If people are hungry for, for you know, park space or or green space, so I think that may be something we want to look at in that Central Grove. Is at least for the two northern blocks, if those want to be that sort of gracious, a little bit more park-like in character, and I think we do have enough space to do that. And Dan. Can I just really quickly, one thing that comes to mind, part of the scale is also the street. And we've talked about sometimes closing streets. And so thinking about that, you know, what is a, a performance of the like three times a year when you really need the space for a large crowd, you know, how much of that can be the street space? Just a thought that popped in. Yep. My turn. Yep. Um, okay, one comment to Rob on the Calisphere. So we've, um, our group has gathered obviously over the, like four years, a lot of photos that, you know, a lot have been published, but a lot haven't. And I want to concur that um, there was a lot of non-mission, you know, not that I'm anti-mission in spots, if it's well done, if the windows are recessed the way they used to be, if you use authentic materials, they can be nice buildings. Um, but that rustic revival caca that's happened over the last two decades is, you know, what we're all thinking about. Um, but that said, there was, you know, there was Art Deco downtown. There was, um, as Rob pointed out, there was, uh, you know, semi-modern you know, if you could call it that back in 1920s, that you can scale up, et cetera. So you guys are all welcome to those, to those photos. Um, I think everything that you guys have talked about, um, I had down. The one thing I want to say, and I know it's outside our scale, uh, because we have the 10 blocks, and that doesn't include the park. But from what I, you know, our research indicates is when Campbell designed the original street grid, it was to lead into Santa Clara's first park. And that is a very underutilized, um, whenever I drive by it, there's two people walking their dogs and that's it. So um, I'm not asking to increase the scale of by any means, you know, beyond the 10 blocks, but people utilizing the downtown will be, you know, if designed correctly, that park, or, or change somewhat uh, is, a, is a huge area, green space for gathering. And I, I concur that, you know, we have too many of those spaces in a very small, you know, 10 block area. There's, there's uh, and again, you guys are the experts, you know, but um, I think that, that uh, needs to be looked at. Um, one point we, I don't think we've ever brought up is the street lights on a, triggered me on this uh, is that I agree there should be overhead and it should be well lit. Um, but the original streetlight castings are still in existence on Franklin street in the university area. Um, they were the base, the art deco base for what was, I think two or three lamps. Um, and those could be easily, recreated so we'd like to see those um and then i think this is a repeat from rob 
is um, back to the and don't you don't have to flip back to it because of time, but the building articulation slide um, that you can put in elements. Um, there was quite a bit of Art Deco awning that went street wide or street long. That you know you put that that 1930s Deco fascia on it, and it it looks authentic. I mean, I've, I've seen it in other locations and, um, and that can harken back to the, um, to the buildings of old because quite a few of those had that on their first floor. And then lastly is, can an architect be incentivized uh, to maybe, sorry about this room, I'm gonna go dark here in a second. Um, there we go, Blair Witch. <laughs> um, that means my time is up. There we go. Um, can an architect be incentivized to recreate, you know, castings of maybe some of the old buildings and utilizing that in their architecture? So that's all I've got. Great. Really good discussion. Great comments. Um, so I think that was good. Um, you know, this is by no means the last chance to comment on the placemaking. So we're going to we're going to take it to the next stage and start drafting uh, our strategy. And then, uh, you know, there there will be enough another chance to look at that and, and make sure that we're hitting the right tone on on all these issues. Um, OK, should we move to so first, if there's no other comments from task force members, we do need to open it to the public for any comments they may have. Okay. I just had one question and it came up in the previous meeting and I thought it was, rather, I can't remember who original thought it was. Maybe it was you. Um, will the master plan include a vocabulary of um, historic references of the type of architecture that existed? Because it seems like we bounce around between three words it's Spanish, Spanish Revival, or modern. And there's a lot of, as Rob said, and everyone else referenced here, there was a lot of different types in between. So I was, is it easier to list what existed and what could be not replicated, but inspired by as what existed as part of the master plan? Like, oh, look, we had Art Deco here and we oh. had um, um, five other styles in the downtown. So that, because I think not enough people realize that. I don't think the a community even realizes that because it's gone, it's been mm -hmm. demolished. Was that part of the plan? I recall a You know, not specifically, but I think it's a great idea. I think Having we could no have habits. a little section on there and it could be, you know, here are some of the, you know, the best representative buildings in the old downtown yeah. and this is what style they were and even pointing out you know here are here are some elements of these buildings that were really um you know character defining like i love the image that rob showed uh on the you know the canopy that comes out over the streets with those beautiful thin columns and just point out some of those elements. So I think it's a great idea. I think I think we should do that. It might make it easier so we're all speaking the same language. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to bring up one thing and that's what David had said about, you know, Anna, you were talking about, you know, how do we make sure the architecture is done good? Well, so what David, you know, that example that I put up about ben, in Ventura, that one building that I had noticed thought was done well, he was brought in as a consultant to fix, help improve that and guide that. He said, you know, there was a previous several iterations that weren't so good and, and then it got there. So there's probably gonna be a consultant that's hired um, to help the process along, you know, so. Yep. Okay. Great. Dan, your hand is still up, but I'm gonna assume that that was from before. <laughs> Look, Sorry, you still don't have anybody. You can't see anyone chatting, right? I still can't see. No, anyone. I think somehow the chat got turned off. Okay. Um, on our Zoom account. So just um, 
for the public, I want to remind everybody that if you want to speak, you're going to have to raise your hand. Unfortunately, the chat is not working this evening. So we do have one person so far raising their hand. Donna? Uh, yep. Go ahead. Go ahead, Donna. I'm mute. <laughs> Hello? Hi. Hi. Um, no, thank you, everyone. This looks fantastic. And I just want to add on to what Butch was talking about. I've been spending time in downtown Mountain View as a place for everyone to see. And when you talk about, are you walking in a tunnel with the height? Mountain View has recently completed the higher buildings toward El Camino. It's Castro Street, and you have the one and two stories by Central Expressway. And then as you walk down Castro Street, you have those higher buildings. I do not feel that tunnel feeling. I mean, it's like it, the way those buildings are, you know, the architecture is amazing. And then they have on the side streets, the neighborhood housing, which I get upset with. So sorry about that, people. <laughs> but that housing outside of Castle Street is really nice and well put together. And again, that's the form based code that's, you know, they're still building. They're still, I think Sobrato just uh, come, uh, got a new development plan approved last year during the pandemic. So they're still adding on and building, but you don't feel the tunnel, you, you know. Uh, it's just now activating and putting it to use as Matthew said. Um, so walk downtown Mountain View if you want to experience something local with the height. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I see Skip. You can go ahead and unmute yourself, Skip. I think I did. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, this is really fascinating discussion. The first two blocks facing Lafayette are the ones that are going to be developed first. And to get that kind of uniqueness that Butch is talking about means that the first two blocks have to really be unique. If they're really unique, the rest of the city will follow. And so therefore, one of the items, uh, I think Washington should be a little bit more thought of um, because Washington is the gateway to the city-owned half block on Fremont, which um, uh, surely one of the most old, oldest buildings in uh, downtown Santa Clara and one of the biggest. And eventually that will be something tied in with the downtown. So I don't think you should forget Washington. Another thing, my vision, uh, which I've already said before, no problem saying it again, is that the garage in the uh, block B, I envision glass elevators going up and down all day and night. Of course, at night they're lit. And that would be a real nice uh, visual uh, look and effect. Um, when Jim had the overhead uh, view of the first two blocks off of uh, Lexington, and he said that above, where it showed the uh, marquee for the Santa Clara Theater, if that was not mixed use and that was is, and that was part of the uh, garage, that whole half block was part of a garage, which by the way would be the same size as the garage that was put in downtown Campbell and back of the Keys, except Campbell made the mistake of only making it three stories and it's always full. We need a six story there. But if that were that whole half a block were uh, was a garage, then potentially uh, could have green uh, roof on top of it, uh, if not a park, um, restaurants or whatever. And then lastly, the um, 
um, to me, it seems like the, and I know everyone's already thought of this many, many times, but it seems like, especially in Franklin, the buildings, we don't want four or five story buildings, six story buildings facing each other without any setbacks. So maybe in the, um, in the plan, something to the effect that a developer above, um, uh, above two stories has to uh, set back the building, or it could go maybe three stories and then set back the building. If it goes three stories, it'd have to set it back even more with terraces or whatever. Um, and then find square footage elsewhere um, that would be taken away from, from those buildings. That's it, thanks. Thank you, Skip. Next, I have Ed. Ed, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, can you hear me? Good evening. Yes, we can, thank you. Hey, Jim, would it be possible to put up the slide that you had earlier with the theater and the movies on it, please? All right. So something that, that uh, Adam mentioned that, that I found is a problem when, when um, and I saw in your image as well, when we have the kind of farmer's market and in that image you have the, the people watching the show and also kind of hanging out with their kids, there's no kind of seating built in at all in any of that. So, you know, if I buy a sandwich from the, from the market or if I, if I want to watch the movie, would it be better in, instead of having that kind of flat um, planar surface to have some sort of uh, undulations that you know provide seating for people that want to watch the movie somebody wants to buy their sandwich um it kind of is a bit flat at the moment and uh, i'm wondering if you know if, if we're making preparations for you know christmas lights and um markets and 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 movies would it also be smart to build in um some sort of human scale you know seating and planting that um makes it look a little bit less like a uh, town, uh, a town square of your, but more like a kind of um, undulating uh, um, place to, to to have little pockets where people can sit and have their have their food. Uh, Peter or Diksha, could one of you share that image? I'm sorry, is this not the image that you wanted to see? I don't think you're sharing. You're not sharing it. Oh. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so Ed, you're talking about the sidewalk space in front of the theater, right? You'd like to see a little bit more there. Oh, in the plaza space or the sidewalk space? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, one of your images showed a market on the on the Franklin Street, but but also the market as well. I mean, you've got people here sitting on the floor, so um, you know, maybe like a, an outdoor theater where you have the I don't know what the right word is, but the the like a bank. That, that also can be seating at the same time. So, so people don't have to bring chairs along with them, basically. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Good idea. Yeah. Integrated seating. Uh, so. Or terrace seating. seating. Yeah. Terrace seating, something like that. It can be an art form also. You know, it can be multi-faceted. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's 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 also getting back to the intimacy and scale question that we've been talking about, breaking up a larger space into smaller spaces. Right. Great. That is all the hands I see. Is there anyone else from the public would like to speak before we close this item and move on? Okay. I see. All right, Leslie. All right, so item number three is precise plan implementation tools. And again, we have our excellent consultants to present some information to us. So this is a little bit of a hard transition from, <laughs> from uh, the material of recovery from the fun stuff. to this. So I'm not sure how well this is going to work. And it's 745, but we'll give it a shot. Um, and I'll try, not, I'll try to be brief. Um, for some reason, my light is going on and off. Um, so we, 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 we've been being asked to, to really and 
and challenged by by this committee and others to really think about implementation and how can we make this actually succeed. So we wanted to share some of our um, the sort of framework for that that would go into the plan. Um, starting with implementation strategies that have to do with streets and public space. So the first one on the list, and I think perhaps the most important for this project to succeed is going to be establishing the right of way and creating streets. And so I think land dedication as part of development is, is the, the likely linchpin of that, um, that the specific plan will require that developers um, you know, adhere to this vision and that involves dedicating land part of the property for street right of way and you know with the acknowledgement that we're also doing a, a very significant up zoning so that um, while there's some land that would be having to be um, uh, devoted to public space um, there the, the other parts of their property have much increased development capacity um, there are other um, other strategies as well um, that can be can be um, looked at um, there's the existing um, Franklin Street easement, and there's an opportunity to, to sort of develop that in an interim way, even before the full street is available. And I think that's its own standalone project. Um, and then there's street, street design and construction. Um, and then to complete that construction, um, all of the elements of the streetscape, green infrastructure, street furnishings, wayfinding and identity signage, public art and interpretation, that full package um, needs to be created. Um, then there's the modification of existing streets. So that would be, I guess I want to back up the new streets. If you look on the diagram to the right, you see that existing property ownership map. And then you see below that is the diagram of the plan as we envision the district to take shape. So you can see that the new streets really are Franklin Street between Lafayette and Monroe, Washington Street, and Main Street. And at least uh, Franklin and Washington have pretty, um, pretty achievable paths forward, um, even, even in the near term. Um, Main Street may be a longer term endeavor. Um, then, there's, then there's modification of existing streets. And here, I think we would make the distinction between the perimeter streets, which may have their own improvement um, sort of program that may be part of a citywide process. Um, we would distinguish between those streets and the interior streets, which would be improved as part of future development downtown. Um, public space design and construction, the parking garage, um, as we've um, been discussing a little bit. And then to pull all of this together, a financing plan. So those are all the uses. Those are all of the public things that need to be created. Um, so how do we pay for it? Um, and so the financing plan um, which we're going to hear more about um, uh, next month or possibly in January um, with our subconsultants EPS. Um, we will be plugging in um, estimated costs of all of those public amenities, the streets and the public spaces, um, the parking garage, parking garages, um, and utilities. And then understanding, um, beginning to understand how do we pay for it? What are the, what are the potential sources for that? Um, and um, we're going to be looking at the possibility of an area development impact fee, um, some kind of a tax increment financing mechanism. Those are probably the most likely um, and most um, promising sources. Um, there could be special assessments um, that maybe faces some more challenges. Um, and then private contributions like land, de land dedication as part of development will be important as well. Um, moving on to implementation elements that are related to development, to the buildings. Um, so now I'm going to again look at the diagram on the, the two diagrams on the right. Now we, we're seeing the existing property ownership and buildings. And then below that, we're seeing the future urban forms. So we're trying to imagine the transition from, from that existing to that future condition. So the form-based code that we've been talking about tonight a bit is the is one of the immediate tools that will be to implement this precise plan that will follow this precise plan and in fact is, is already underway. Um, that will provide a more detailed definition of the, of the essential and flexible uses that this plan is, is talking about. 
It will provide more detailed ground floor development standards for retail spaces and for catalyst uses to really um, um, make it, um, you know, codify in the appropriate to the appropriate level of detail um, how buildings meet the street, and then building height and massing standards. The second, um, the second feature here, the second implementation um, tool is the idea of providing bonus height for community benefits. And so you see our height and massing model has these two tiers with the, with the base maximum height and the bonus maximum height. So the idea is that we would set up a system where um, community amenities and catalyst uses could achieve additional floor area for developers. And we'd wanna make that attractive because we really want to make those things part of the plan. Um, Transfer of development rights from older and historic buildings would be another likely use, um, just as a way, an implementation tool to, um, to try to, to ensure that those existing houses um, remain. The third strategy here is um, a development uh, plan for blocks A and B. And I think we've all been saying that that's most likely to take place first. It has the most realistic chance um, to, to, to get lift off in the near term. Um, so that the city um, would be um, needing to provide real leadership there in instigating a development, developer engagement process um, consistent with the Surplus Land Act that would um, begin to um, create the conditions for blocks A and B to develop. The fourth point here is um, coordination with property owners. Now, even for blocks A and B, there, there is one non-city property owner, um, the, that, that's the university um, here in the, up in, at the corner of Benson and Lafayette. Um, other blocks are gonna require other kinds of coordination and collaboration um, between property owners. So blocks D and E, I'm sorry, blocks D and F um, likely um, move forward as, as a unit, potentially move forward as a unit. Um, blocks C and E may move forward as a unit, but perhaps in a longer term, condition and blocks uh, G and H, which are Franklin Square, you know, have their own condition and those may be moved forward together in a unit. We don't know that, um, but coordination between property owners in those, in those ways um, are, is likely going to be an important part of implementation. And then there's the development design and the city review and approval process. And we've talked about that a little bit today too, in terms of how do we ensure that the vision of this plan um, is achieved. Um, and then we have tools that have to do with activation. Um, the first one of these is um, near-term activation so that even before development is really underway, there are some things that, that are already being done and can be done with a little more energy perhaps um, to bring people downtown and start setting, you know, keep, keep, keep people's habits um, alive to the extent they are alive now with the farmer's market and the annual events. And then maybe try to boost that. Um, maybe it's um, it's pop up events. Maybe it's painting um, painting the easement and and bringing in involving local artists, bringing in local food vendors, um, just bringing people downtown. Um, the second strategy we're identifying here is the creation or the exploration of a downtown management entity of some kind, and, and we don't know yet um, what form that might take. Um, we also have members of our team coming to present to you soon on that topic. And that kind of entity might take on business recruitment and retention, marketing, um, parking management, and public space programming. And there may be other roles as well. Um, there needs to be a district identity branding signage and wayfinding plan. Uh, there needs to be a public art and interpretation program. And then sort of following off, following those plans and programs, there would be calls for submissions from artists, and there would be placement of signage, art, and interpretive elements. So, uh, you know, it's not comprehensive. Um, it is our first uh, pass at a framework for, for implementing um, the plan, and, and we're looking forward to hearing creative ideas from you as well. Are there any task force members that want to kick off any comments or questions on this one? I just have a quick comment. Sorry, I wasn't called on. Can I? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, where'd you go? Adam fell um, off my screen. I can't. See. The um, I 
you know, leveraging the 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 sort of um, public amenity and the the build out is that's always a just a huge challenge. And um, I like the fact that you've thought about a bunch of different approaches. Um, when we talk about the the bonus, the the bonus heights, the bonus uses, and in, in return for, um, I just want to make sure we're also referencing the the feasibility analysis that you conducted. I, we're on like meeting twenty six, right? So like somewhere back at at meeting twenty three, twenty three. Yeah, so um, it, just to make sure that we are uh what leveling our our process with what we did in terms of the um uh and i know that was a static kind of current market environment and so there's always limits but just referencing kind of what we thought was viable in the market and make sure that we yeah that we're just cognizant of that challenge because sometimes we that bonus is actually the thing that tips you into feasible as opposed to, you know, gravy. And so I just, I, if we could, when you do that, when you think about that part of the, the financing, if we could just cross check with that feasibility analysis, that'd be great. So um, we actually, we did establish that base and bonus, that base height and bonus height threshold really with that market feasibility okay. as a core um, input. So we don't, like you say, you know, it's not, it's perhaps more art than science, that economics, and it's a little bit static. And I think we shouldn't over freight it, but we certainly use that as, as a major input into that model. All right, any other comments from the PCTF members? Uh, I have a question about the coordination with property owners. Will that always be the city planning department or would we hire like another WRT to handle that coordination? I mean, how is that managed? Can you, can you elaborate? Are you talking about like re-entitlement of existing property or, or coordination between new development and old development? Uh, new and old development, we, we know that Prometheus is an ideal opportunity. We know that Swenson is an ideal opportunity. Um, and they have some of the best pieces of our downtown. So is there uh, an outreach that's from us to them? I mean, from the city, when I say us, to them to initiate? Or is it them deciding they want to initiate? I mean, is there any assistance with that process by anyone? Or is it just has to happen organically that they want to do it? Yeah, in this current day and age, I think it's more organically. Um, you know, if they come forward, we can always encourage, you know, multiple property owners to talk to each other and try to work with each other and make that relationship. Um, I suppose there could be a policy decision by the city council to make this something that that the city works on, um, that's not typical. But yeah, it would be the two property owners. You know, you could say, let's say Barry Swenson came in first and us as the city would say, hey, we've got this precise plan. Why don't you go talk to this property owner and see if they're interested? Well, a lot of times we'll, they'll do that. They'll do a good faith effort, um, but yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Any other DCTF members before we move to the public? Okay, we'll open up public comment. Uh, anyone in the public would like to speak on this, this item, the implementation plan? Please raise your hand. I see no hand. I see no hand. All right, we'll close public comment. Thank you, everyone. So uh, thank you, WRT, for coming in this evening and giving us your presentation. Really appreciate it. I think we got a lot of good feedback.
And Thank so you. We, all, we, we made it just five minutes past eight o'clock. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. So close. So close. <laughs> All right. Um, I, we can. They can go, right, Leslie? If they'd like to, or they can stay and listen. Well, you're welcome to hang but... out and grind through the rest of this with us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for your yeah. input tonight. It was, it was, as always, really valuable and and much appreciated. Thank you, Jim. Thank, Thank you, you all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Everyone's great. All right. Good night. Well, Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. All right, Chair, right. would you like to move to item four? Item number four. This is the discussion on returning Main Street to the downtown street grid sooner by spurring the redevelopment of Block C, D, E, and F. And this is going to be presented to you this evening by member Andresek. He's going to try to share his screen. Okay. And Peter, this last part was a real good segue into what I'm about to talk about. So while I'm trying to share the screen, can you guys see that? I see your Zoom launch. And I'm Can't unable to join as a <laughs> panelist. There's all the stuff I got to do tomorrow. All right, there, there we go. go. There we go. All right, so our first uh, our first ECTF meeting um, I don't know if it was Thompson or somebody said this is going to be three years. And I thought there's no way that's going to happen. And our first meeting was June 11th, 2019, just two and a half years ago. So I want to start by thanking everybody on this dais for Leslie, Rena, Andrew, um, staff, city management council, and the mayor for getting us this far. Um, we have this plan uh, that we just talked about and we were just envisioning, you know, blocks A and B. Um, so we've got our what. Um, the question is, which was brought up just now is our why or our how, which is block C, D, uh, E and F. And um, the question that, that our group that Reclaiming Our Downtown has been investigating since April is, is this how. Um, we've all been resigned to the fact, I think, you know, some of the comments that just happened was, um, you know, that, that Jim had said, we hope that, that Blocks A and B inspire the developments of CDE and F. Um, but with our, you know, in the last six, seven months, in speaking with these property owners, uh, it could be 40 years, you know, Prometheus just did a major upgrade, you know, they're happy there, the courthouse is, is there, um, you know, could a more organic thing happen? Um, what we wanted to do is investigate, you know, what within the 10 blocks within Santa Clara, the state, uh, the, the country is going on right now that might inspire development, uh, not in 40 years, which could be the case, you know, in the case of Prometheus, um, but maybe in the next decade. And this, what, what I'm about to talk about is, is not something that's gonna happen tomorrow or even next year, but could happen in the short term. So we, we formed a team to look at the possibilities of, um, and that's, that's all we're doing tonight is a what if. And what we woke to is, is really, um, and I'm going to quote, uh, quote somebody that I just talked to. It's, it's kind of a, a coming together of the stars. We've, we've got a, an engaged public that for the first time since 65 has really come together. Uh, I think we heard this in our last couple meetings where there's general agreement uh, between groups that, you know, 10, 20 years ago used to fight like cats over, over the downtown. You have BART coming to Santa Clara for the first time in 50 years after it was envisioned and a half a mile from downtown. This makes downtown and the surrounding area a perfect place for real uh, transit-oriented development. 
you have a need for affordable housing by the same city, county, and state that own or lease property uh, to the courthouse. And we've spoken with representatives, assembly folks, and there's a hell of a lot more interest in affordable housing than there is three traffic courts there. Um, there are places as we've, we've spoken about, and I don't know if you can, I'm, I'm not high tech here, so I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right across from Liberty Towers where we can go eight to 10 floors, <laughs> Lafayette, we've, we've agreed we can go high, higher there. Um, so there are places in downtown with more heights. Um, and we have a 60 year old city hall that will need to be rebuilt. Not, you know, again, not tomorrow, and this is contentious, but in the next, the next decade. It was built when Santa Clara had 33,000 people. You got four X that now. Um, you, you've got a need for about five to 600 employees, 1,100 total, but non-fire, non-police is about 500 plus. Um, there's four to five conference rooms, limited bathrooms. Uh, I, I just heard today some staff is working in closets. Uh, you have a council member room that the room I'm sitting in right now is bigger than the room that they sit in. And it's so small, in fact, that due to the Brown Act, they have to revolve. They can't, they can't all be in that room at the same time. So to us, it's not a, it's not a question of if, it's when City Hall is gonna be either you know, uh, rebuilt or moved. And we took a look at that. What we did is we went went searching out again to different cities, which we did, you know, two years before looking for, you know, best practices with downtowns. And like Santa Clara, there were several or scores of cities that moved their city halls out of downtown and then back to downtown. And since June of 2021, so about, you know, it's been about six months, we've been getting up at about five in the morning and calling back east to interview leaders from these cities to understand the results after City Hall was returned. And these are a couple of the findings. Now it's a late hour, so I'm not gonna go into all of them. I'm gonna pick three of them probably, um, maybe three and a half, you bear with me. First one's New Rochelle, New York. Uh, original City Hall was built in 1907. Uh, City Hall moved out of downtown in 63. They announced plans to move City Hall back to downtown in 2017. We interviewed the Commissioner of Development, Louis Aragon. And I wanna point out that Louis, pardon me a second. Louis is available for, uh, for interview both to this group and to council if council's interested. So he, he made it himself available for this. Um, in, in talking with him, it, it's amazing. It, he did the same thing we're doing right now. Uh, citizens group, precise plan, form-based code, but they added the return of City Hall to downtown as one of their main goals. Prior to this announcement, there was one building built in Rush New Rochelle in 10 years. Downtown was in decline and the residents were a little pissed off about it and wanted, wanted politicians or the representatives to do something about it. Since the announcement of the downtown plan and City Hall returning downtown, 32 projects totaling 4 billion in investments have been improved, approved in the last four years. That block area that would have generated 97 million, not in revenue, sales revenue, but tax revenue, over a 20 year period is estimated now to bring in 530 million. Uh, in speaking with Lewis, uh, since then he's up that to about 900 million, but you know, I took this, uh, took this out of the paper. What he drove home is if the public sector invests, the private sector follows. And we're gonna hear that over and over. Now I wanna talk a little bit about how they did it. Uh, because this leads into my last foil. 
this was the city hall of the future. So they didn't pick up a city hall with the parking and move it to a location. Uh, they did a public private uh, type of development where mixed use offset the costs of city hall. Uh, a developer was allowed 282 units of office, 9,500 square feet of retail, and in return, the developer agreed to build out a brand new city hall and civic complex, which could be a courthouse, at the base of the building. So it had an opulent you know, entranceway, retail on the side, offices above. So with that, you have the option to either upside, upsize if city hall grows or downsize because of the office flexibility above and below. Um, this is a quote from their mayor, city hall moving back town, downtown will put the people's house back into the heart of the city, making a bold statement of confidence in our future. Now I wanna juxtapose that to a quote, we're doing another branch of research on what happened to downtown and how it was destroyed. Here's another quote from 60 years ago from our mayor, Anthony Toledo. If you remove city hall from downtown, it will spell the death of all the retailers and downtown Santa Clara itself. That was three years before the last building went down. Sandusky, Ohio. So we, we uh, interviewed city manager, Eric Wobster. The original downtown was built in 86. They moved out in 58. Uh, city Hall moved back downtown in June of 2017. And in those last five years since the announcement, they've had 30 new businesses. This was our interview with Eric. They've had 17 buildings that have either been rehabbed or are about to begin the process of construction. All told, downtown's drawn 100 million in investment in five years, and that's during COVID. Uh, what he uh, repeated a couple of times is you need a city champion to create an amazing downtown. Malden, Massachusetts, uh, 1857 to 75. Now this is a freaky deal because they didn't move it out of downtown. What they did is they put this crazy building right on Main Street, which sounds pretty familiar. So they, they took this beautiful colonial city hall and put this block that the Boston Globe immediate, you know, said for more than four decades, Malden's cavernous government center literally divided the downtown in half and it's now being knitted back together. Like New Rochelle, well, let me back up. The city knew instantly it made a mistake in the 70s because it blocked the train station and killed the town squ square. Citizens hated it and RFP was put out and like New Rochelle, City Hall did a private public um, development, ground up development for 320 residential units in two buildings, a 45,000 square foot office space, which included within the new City Hall and more than 22,005 square foot of ground floor retail. So we went from this to this. Now I'm not, Nuts about the architecture, but I am crazy about what that might do to Main Street with that overpass. So they put City Hall on one side and um, I believe residential office on the other. After that happened, uh, it reconnected downtown to the city. They got $190 million in renovation and development, went into the downtown during the pandemic. So this was all through 20 and 21. Multiple businesses immediately opened their doors and we even interviewed their retailers just to confirm. And they said that City Hall's 30% of their entire business. Uh, even the bar said, you know, kind of off, off record, I probably shouldn't be printing this, but they get a lot of business from City Hall after, after hours. Now, I've got a bunch of others. Uh, Euclid, Wisconsin, DeKalb, Illinois. We're, we're getting late here, so I won't go into it, but it, it's, it's the same thing. They moved out, they moved in, development occurred immediately after. Uh, it sparked it. In the case of Euclid, 
um, there was a renaissance that happened in downtown uh, per their economic development manager. Multi-story apartment buildings, new commercial structures like the Lismore Hotel were put in immediately after. Now I'm gonna conclude with Winter Garden um, in Florida. What they did is they moved City Hall to the center of downtown. And it's Art Deco, which I love, but it's Florida and everybody puts Art Deco up and I don't know how you feel about that, but what they did is they put this in the center of the building, of the, of the downtown. And again, public investment produces private investment. In the 50s through 90s, their downtown was in squalor. Uh, the city came in, restored a hotel, the downtown theater, uh, their, their main street, a clock tower. And in 2008, they built this building. And this building, I'm gonna to talk to both Anna and Deborah about how it was designed, because I think it's something we need to consider for ours. Um, right after it was built, all of these businesses, these um, townhouse projects, these offices were all put in after 2008. Tanya Gearhart's, the uh, economic development director said that this caused things to really take off. But I wanna talk about the building. So it was not designed for an eight to five, close the door, you know, everything's done um, kind of city, city hall. It's, it's a very interactive city hall. Instead of becoming the problem, it became the solution. Uh, that, that Gothic entranceway uh, enters into an art gallery, the city art gallery where the art is changed every, uh, I think it's every month or two months. Uh, the building is white, as you can see. Right now it's a light show for Christmas time. So you see Santa flying across and reindeer and it's red and, red and green. Two months ago, it was Halloween. On this side of the building, there's a screen that they show uh, movies at night to gather people there, uh, which is very active. Um, this, this is an amphitheater where people gather to speak publicly. Uh, the, the, the chambers, the uh, council chambers are used for rotary, for any kind of public meeting. So it's really an interactive, um, synergistic building with the downtown. And I wanted to point it out because I really liked it. You juxtapose that with what we have and, you know, fairly or unfairly, it was built in 63. Um, again, we're not advocating for its destruction. We're just advocating for investigating what happens when it's time, which time's coming up pretty quick. And um, one of the things that, you know, I've got everything listed here that I, I stated before, but one of the pushbacks is, you know, and I can hear probably Manuel on the phone just ready to go on this. We studied it, you know, with alternative four and four A because reclaiming wanted that done. But what four and four A really was, was plopping a building that would have been on Warburton into somewhere else in the city. So it was a city hall entity with underground parking, which is going to be archaic in 20 years. Um, which cut 400 million down to 300 million. We're not saying that. We, we don't feel that Smith Group uh, did anything wrong in answering the question. The problem wasn't the answer. The problem was the question. And we think it needs to be re-asked. And this is why. A mixed-use city hall located downtown would defer millions through added value of office or housing above or to the side. Multiple sites exist downtown for an eight to 10 story structure. A taller structure could produce up to six stories of income for City Hall. City Hall's need is 162,000 square feet, which equates to about four stories. And again, this is volunteer math, so I'll probably be corrected, but um, we're pretty close. You're gonna get revenue above. Affordable housing, 
would create government advocacy for moving or uh, changing the courthouse, opening up Main Street. And we've heard that firsthand from, um, from government represent, representation that we've talked to over these last couple months. A downtown city hall would eliminate the need for another parking garage. Number five by itself saves you know, 20, 30 million bucks. Because if you look at the plan, and if you can see my cursor, if I can get it, City Hall, let's say it's built in this area, you got a parking garage right here. You do not need to build a new parking garage. These will all be um, during off hours. Uh, City Hall is used from eight to five for a majority of the, the employees. They leave at five o'clock and that's when the the dinner hour and, and nightclub hour starts for downtown. Six, a city owned temporary location for City Hall exists today at Commerce Plaza. So if City Hall were torn down, city, if it, or city workers could be located right here while this is being built. And there are TOD benefits in placing City Hall one half mile from BART and the Santa Clara Station Hub that have never existed before. The key is would any other location stimulate the development that we've seen in these many, many American cities? And again, we've had you know, five or six months and you know, we're constantly finding more that have done that and we're gonna continue you know, digging into this as a group. But um, what we're asking uh, this is a repeat, is where in Santa Clara would a city hall need to be built that would create the greatest value for Santa Clara and its citizens? Having the city hall in a residential area creates negative impacts that need to be mitigated. A city hall built downtown creates social, civic, financial, and environmental reduced car trip benefits. So what, uh, you know, I've, I've spoken to Adam about this. What we would like to do is to go before city council as DCTF and ask them to open this up and to study and understand how a downtown city hall would benefit Santa Clara citizens by stimulating the downtown economy and additional development. So instead of this thing going from like, oh, it's organic and one day Prometheus is going to see the light or city, you know, the courthouse or whatever, you know, this stimulates that. And due to its location, saves taxpayer money through that mixed use, um, you know, process that we've seen in, in multiple cities across America. And we secondly, we want those questions answered by a group that has been studying this downtown for three years, and that's WRT. So that's, that's what I've got. And uh, I yield the floor. Is that how you say it? I can't see anything. Yeah, yield, that works. I yield my time. I yield my time. Thank you, Adam. You're welcome. So Dan, are you, what you're asking is to understand how, like how much space the downtown based on Smith's uh, the Smith report, how much space the down the city hall would need in the downtown footprint. Correct. And then what would be the economic or the potential foot traffic during the time versus what we have currently in the plan for whatever space it takes up. Well, and I think, I think, yes, I'll both yes to both of those, but I think that that there's also a, you know, with WRT, with the creativity I've seen with WRT is, you know, could a concept be created that would also show um, cost benefits? If you go to this 4A, um, there's no cost benefits. You know, it's, it's just, you slap a city hall, it's the number of stories you need and plonk, it goes down. What about mixed use? You know, what, 
what does that save? Is there, you know, if, if we're allowed to build across from Liberty Towers, which is 11 stories, and you could put a nine or 10 story building there or one on, on you know, possibly Lafayette, what would those six floors generate? Um, if you went to the affordable housing side of things, um, what would that do to the courthouse? You know, would the, you know, would that, would that stimulate a, a movement in that opening that part of Main Street, the the south part of Main Street? Um, so it's, you know, it's it's more than that. And then on top of that, the garage savings. You know, the how much does a garage cost? You know, even underground parking. I mean, if if we've got five hundred employees, how many parking spaces is that? And if you've got a garage that is relatively empty between the hours, you know, when, when the mixed use people from downtown leave to go to work and they get on their trolley, Butch's trolley, and they go to the train, take BART, that parking garage is empty. That can be filled up with City Hall. So it's synergistic. And even, I mean, out of all of these, you know, what I got nine or eight of these things, any one of these is reason for further investigation because it wasn't considered. And I think that, you know, the main two that glare at me are mixed use, which saved a ton of money for New Rochelle. And again, Louise Aragon is open and free of charge. Um, you know, one of the things that, that took us all by surprise is how enthusiastic city managers, council people, mayors got on the phone with us. They were crazy about, about the idea of a, a blank chalkboard and building a downtown from scratch. And it was refreshing, it, it kind of re-energized us. This guy will get on the phone with us and talk to us about you know, the, you know, the nuts and bolts of what he did, as will Malden. So, I think those two issues are, you know, those have to be considered as well in the in the formula. So So what you're asking to have I, I just want to make sure we're, we get the ask right. So, I mean, I don't think we could do, a, I think the full-blown study, correct me if I'm wrong, Leslie, I mean, well, but. Pardon me, guys. Yeah, the full-blown the full -blown study was abandoned once the cost was kind of realized to be out of reach of the mm -hmm. this time. So, I mean, but I think to Dan's point, we, sh you know, is it possible to have, you know, take the numbers that Smith Group already put together and just understand how much physical space that down the city hall would take in the downtown and what its potential economic benefit through bringing people in and out throughout a longer span potentially than just residential or office would potentially be in the economic study. Dan, just, just wanted to provide a correction if that's okay. Sure. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so the, the full-blown study was, um, stopped not because of economic uh, feasibility. It was stopped because uh, COVID uh, oh. came along as we were doing it. And then uh, over the last 18, you know, 18 months, um, other priorities have developed. And just to make sure it's everybody, everybody is clear to everybody, the, the initial study was really for a utility building because um, the utility had uh, funding or had the financial capability to build a utility building. But as part of that process, we wanted to master plan the whole site and understand what the entire needs were, not just for the utility, but also for the rest of City Hall. And because there was funding available, we were trying to incorporate some um, additional benefits within the utility building that City Hall could use, right? Like conference rooms, for example, that's a basic one where we, we, are, we were short on conference rooms. So the factor, the driving factor at the time was the utility building. It was all funded through to the utility funds, and obviously um, 
the master plan was done because we had to master plan everything to understand what the needs were and how we could phase the utility building first since that would had had funding. So I just wanted to note that that that's the reason. And we stopped. We 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 you know we got probably about halfway through it. We got the master plan halfway through the contract, and then COVID you know came along, mm-hmm. and uh, we're now prioritizing now. Right now we have a uh, the utility has a uh, three hundred million dollar infrastructure project related to the utility itself. So that would have been. So, so that's kind of where we're at with, with that process. So um, for a city hall, right, if we're focused on city hall and based on the square footage, just Dan's talking about the 162,000 square feet, that's for non-utility uses. Um, the, the utility uses are an additional 80,000 square feet. So if we're talking about the 160,000 square feet and would like to do a study on that, then uh, obviously like Dan's saying, there have to be a, a request um, to the council to provide funding to do that study. It could not be done with utility funds because the utility building wouldn't be part of that um, that analysis unless unless there was a there was a thought that you would try to fit uh, all two hundred and forty thousand square feet downtown and then the utility could no. pay, pay for a portion. So so if there's a request for for analysis, um, certainly that could be made to the council and the general fund would have to fund it at this point. And that's what what we're looking at is not a utility building, obviously downtown. What we're and again, Manuel, we're not we're not coming in charging, and I think there was, you know, a gunshot off before it should have been. Um, you know that, that our intention is not to come in and ramrod, you know, this idea and say, you know, look, city city hall, you know, it's it's falling apart. It's got to come down now. Um, we just see that, you know, we all see it. You see, you got guys, you got guys working in closets and we all know it. Um, you, we, we've talked offline to employees and they're miserable. So it's, it's going to happen. And again, if we wait on the current property owners in my conversation and in reclaiming this conversation, that's four decades if something organic doesn't happen, which this is business, right? Um, organic <laughs> things very rarely happen. But what my point is, is that if it's five years, if it's 10 years, City Hall is gonna have to be rebuilt. It's got, you've got to, you're a, a growing city, you've got a ton of projects and you're losing money because of inefficiencies after COVID is over you know, after people return. And, and what we're doing is we're just asking to investigate when and if that happens, what would the, the, the best place, the best location for synergism for Santa Clara be to locate that city hall? And I went into this skeptical. I was, I pushed back on my group. Um, after talking with these people, I'm not. I'm not skeptical. I think that it's it's not going to you know completely pay for itself, but it's going to defer a ton of money in doing something creative the way that some of these cities have done. And I think it warrants you know investigation from that standpoint. Um, I think the synergism with the garage, um, with with employees many employees aren't going to be taking cars because if we do the transit correctly to the train or if, if city employees work and, and live in that area, um, it's going to reduce yeah. parking spaces. So, 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 so Dan, to be clear, I wasn't, I was just wanted to clarify. Yeah. When, yeah. And I'm, I I'm going on. And was, on. Yeah. I wasn't trying to go back and uh, disagree with anything you said. No, 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 no. I get it. And, and then on the utility building, I just want to note, that um, when I say utility building, the utility building is actually an office building, right? We call it the utility building because it's got the office building for water and sewer and mm-hmm. the office space for Silicon Valley power. So basically what we were doing is we, Silicon Valley power and the water and sewer department have office space within the existing building. Mm-hmm. And then Silicon Valley power has office space that, that it leases somewhere else. So we were looking at taking that office space and moving into a new office building. So I just want to be clear because I'm saying utility sure. building, everybody knows what that is, but it's really an office building is, is what it is. And what we have done is we did, um, we did move all the Silicon Valley power staff out of the current city hall, moved mm-hmm. into a different location where we're already off site. So we have um, 
left that space open, which is currently open to create additional capacity for the other city hall users. So that's a step we already took because we did have a need for space and the Silicon Valley Power office building that was being leased had additional space. So we, we, you know, we uh, emptied out a wing of city hall that's currently available for other departments to expand into. So that's kind of where we're at. So I was just trying to provide clarity. And then on the funding, I thought it was important to note because if there is a request to the council that uh, to do in a study that you're referring to, that um, since we're looking at only moving those city hall uses, not the utility, you know, part of city hall uses, then of course the council would have to consider that. And of course, if they want to do that, and it have to, it would have to be funded out of the general fund. There's no other funding source for it. So I just wanted to note that to make sure that uh, that was clear. So for at this point, I just wanted to clarify what Dan said. And not Dan, but Adam said, um, and, and just yeah, some additional details on what a utility building is. Got since it. Since you're clarifying things, Manuel, since the budget's already been passed, it would have to be a supermajority vote, correct? Yes. If um, if you wanted to do something out of the budget cycle, which if you yeah. wanted to move fast, that's what it would have to. You would need five votes. Although you know, I think you have. Um, if you're talking about downtown, we would have to ask about who can't vote yeah. and what that means. Three. <laughs> so um, that would be part of it. And if it goes as part of the regular budget process, you know, in, in June or June, you know, July 1st, that kicks it, it starts earlier. Then at that, as part of the regular budget process, then it's four votes. Now, if it went four, that would be the super majority, correct? No. When before it would be a super majority, it would require five votes. Okay, so there's no winning. I'm not sure what that means, Dan. Well, because if three people can't vote. Well, if, if right now you have two people who are conflicted out, right? So you still have five people on the council who vote. You need all. Yes, you need all five. Got it. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify that. Yep. And then from a cost perspective, um, you know, I can tell you uh, we have uh, the money we spent so far on the contract. You know, we have all the base information, which is really good, right? You have the number of employees, yeah. you have the square footage, you have all that stuff. Uh, we did a lot of financial analysis. Uh, we did some estimates on the cost of the building. Those, uh, I would say, those have those probably have increased now per square foot um, mm -hmm. based on where we're in 2019. So that would still stand. So I guess it would be about. Um, depending on how complex you want to do it about actually placing a building downtown and where it could go. And then if you're talking about things like uh, public private partnerships, uh, that's, I think it's beyond probably our current consultant that would have, probably have to be somebody else on board um, because it's not typical just for the land use planner to kind of have that uh, expertise. Maybe they do, we have to duck into them, but those are, are pretty complicated. And then for, you know, for 162,000 square feet, we'll go with the numbers that we had back then at $2,000 a square foot, right? That gives you like an idea of how much it would cost and how much you would need to get a public-private partnership. So certainly somebody could run an analysis to see what type of private development, how much private development would require to help fund that part of that. So there's an analysis that could be done for sure. I think it's a request for the council and, um, and we can talk to WRT about how much it would cost to do that, but I mean, it would, I would assume just based on kind of the work we did before, it would be a significant, it, it would not be inexpensive to do so. Um, right, because yeah. because of the uh, data you've already, and, and we we figured that they've, they've done great work on, um, like you said, the, the financial analysis, square footage. Um, so yeah, quite a bit's been done. Yeah, and then for, for us, you know, one of the key goals that we had and the council had was to try to get all city facilities in one place. So uh, obviously, if you're just moving certain parts of City Hall, then you don't end up with those benefits of having kind of all the Silicon Valley power employees, all the water and sewer employees, not that the yard, we have the yard, we have the plants, but all the office employees together with the rest of the City Hall employees. And there are needs, just functional needs that, that we have to account for, like counter services and a few things that we're dealing with today that we're trying to solve. Which could be done on the retail level, you know, on the uh, side street too, you know, the counter yeah. space. Now, Manuel, I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you added those employees that you just talked about, so let's say everybody together. Um, so, you know, water, water. Um, so in other words, the goal was to bring in, forgive me, Silicon Valley power together 
with water, sewer, and city hall? Yeah, the goal was to have the entire city in one location when we were doing the master plan. How, like many, said, empl how many employees is that? Oh gosh, I can tell you how much square footage we needed. Like I don't have the employee count in front of me, but um, for water and sewer and um, Silicon Valley power, as well as the associated um, square footage, you know, with them and a few things, we're around 80,000 square feet. So for city hall, non water and sewer, non SVP, we had about 160,000 square feet for water and sewer and SV and SVP, we had an additional 80,000 square feet. So if you combine okay. it all, it was about 240,000 square feet. Got it. Okay. And that's when, when you're talking about the, the cost that we had for 437 million, that was for a 242,000 square foot building, which was everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. The city's the city's workforce is approximately a thousand and ninety-five full-time employees. And that's fire and police. So. Yes. Yes. Right. So that would exclude Which, fire and police, Dan. And you know, I don't have like I said, and of course we did growth as well when we look at the future building. We didn't just go by existing employee count. Right, right. We also looked at future employees as well. So that didn't just account for um, current employees, but also I believe was 20 year growth or so, uh, mm -hmm. adding additional employees as well. Okay. Well, well you can put me, and by the way, you can put me on the spot anytime. No, 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 no. This helps. I, wanted, I know. I, I knew Adam was on the spot. About his haircuts. I wanted to show mine today. <laughs> I know. I'm, I don't know why, but Leslie couldn't figure out my camera. I'm still unable. Wait, I, to do it. I'm putting it on there, Leslie. Ed, zero to do with me. <laughs> Sorry, you are, Leslie. You are allowed to use your camera. <laughs> I, it won't let me click. I don't know. I'm sorry. I can't help you. <laughs> sorry, nobody wants to see me anyway. So what do you guys think? Let's open it up to the DCTF. I, think I see Deborah's and Rob hands. So Deborah, I mean, go ahead. I can't see anything. You want me to take this off? Oh, it's okay. You can leave it on. So um, you don't have to see me? Oh, no, you still <laughs> can see me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fourth thing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I want to go back to something that Adam said about making sure that we're framing this well and asking the right question. Mm -hmm. I mean, you never want to ask a question where you don't know what the answer is going to be, right? Number one. Mm -hmm. But there's also long been um, an inferred um, benefit of moving uh, City Hall to downtown. And that is that it would uh, make available the land it would be vacating. Right, which, you know, as I've heard it talked about, then maybe Prometheus would move in there and then, you know, we'd have the grid back and, and all that. And I, I just think that we need to make sure that we're addressing that entire cycle um, because otherwise um, Prometheus would still be there, right? And uh, we would still be facing um, the state uh, courthouse as well. So, Asking this question, even if it, even if the answer, the even if the only answer would be that it would have to move downtown, the city hall would have to move downtown. Um, it still doesn't uh, impact any of the other issues that are blocking, um, you know, opening up the streets and, um, you know, accelerating as you said, or or uh, getting the, the downtown. Um, what, what was it on the agenda? Um, getting the street, street grid sooner. Correct. Right? Well, and we, we noodled on that. And this, I'm just speaking for, you know, reclaiming and I'll let Adam talk, you know, to the quad or, you know, the rest of you. But to us, that's inferred. Um, I don't want to go into Prometheus in that, um, you know, we're not sitting down negotiating with them. So, you know, it's, it's, but I, I think that by city hall moving that land opens up and I think that's enough said for, you know, everyone, you know, for, to, it's kind of a cagey way of answering your question. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that make sense to you, Deborah? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yep. Yep. But um, this is why I, I just want to make sure that we are framing this 
in a way that's really clear to everybody. And this has been discussed for many years about, you know, sequence of events or whatever that um, could potentially happen. I just want to make sure that we're not misrepresenting what the question actually is. Right. And that's a great, great, you know, it's something that it's a great point. It's something that we've talked hours and hours about, yeah. you know, and, and, and there was a bullet in there, to be honest with you on that. But I, I just, again, you know, think that there's, there's enough evidence um, that, you know, we can find from these other cities that show, you know, massive amounts of enthusiasm from the development community. And I, you know, developers are vilified, but we all know now after three years that this thing is not going to get built without developers. We've had plans in the past, you know, a couple of the six plans of the past were beautiful. They were two stories and three stories and developers looked at it and went, we can't build that. We're not going to make money. Yeah. Um, this is a, a model where, you know, especially the mixed use thing that, you know, for me, I mean, I'm talking personally, is very infatuating because, you know, you have a developer building a building and then housing City Hall and not stuffing them in the back. You know, there again, in each case, there's a grand entrance way, you know, it's City Hall, um, but they you know, they, the developer benefits from the upper floors or from the, the building to the side that's owned by the city or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, talking to Matt, I mean, that, you know, it could be an affordable housing option. It's, you know, who knows, but um, which we, we saw in one situation. Yeah. So I just think, you know, maybe, maybe look at it in, in phases, like, Mm -hmm. um, for example, if City Hall first moved to the existing building, you know, what, number one, what's the feasibility of that and what would be the benefits of that? And then phase two would be they would be in that existing building while the new City Hall is being built. And what kind of financial impact um, does that development have? And then there's, you know, the, the vacated property on Warburton. Correct. If I can provide just one clarification as you do your discussion, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, I, I believe the existing building um, is around 90,000 square feet. And this is something that would have to be looked at by the consultant, right? If, if mm -hmm. this moves forward. I don't believe the existing building can accommodate um, um, all the current staff. It, it has existing um, tenants right now too, doesn't it? Does. It does, yeah, it does. It, I think the, uh, you know, uh, there was a council item a little while ago that it was going to go um, to a, a year to year, you know, initial two year lease and then extension. So there's flex, there'll be flexibility there in, in, in the near yeah. time. Enough, but, yeah. but I yeah. just wanted to note, and, you know, I haven't gone back and I need to go look at the analysis to see how much square footage is needed for current uses. But, you know, for a few, for everything, we were looking at 162,000 square feet. And uh, that building, I believe, is around ninety thousand. So just to give you context, okay. that there's some there's some things that would have to be addressed as part of that, um, yeah. as part of those assumptions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so yeah, let's just be real grounded in our assumptions, and um, again, make sure that we're framing the right question yeah. um, and one that we already know the answer to. And, and I hope that's okay. I'm jumping in when I hear. No, things. by oh, all course. means, that yeah. helps. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I will yield to Rob, who has his hand up. Thank you, Deborah. Rob. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I like this discussion, and I talked to Dan a little bit about this. Um, I, I think what's super important, uh, you know, I like to break whenever I have a problem. I always break it out into smaller, relatable uh, um, examples, and take my old 1860s farmhouse for example that was dilapidated. I couldn't afford to redo that house on my own. So, but I knew that I had land and I had the ability to build a guest house that helped fund my project. Okay. So I built the guest house. I got a tenant in there and that helped me fund my house project. It's the same thing with Dan's talking about. 
I want to look at it. I, I would rather than the city looking at the current parcel and saying, let's build a new down city hall right there. That's a big piece of property. It, it, to me, looking at it just one dimensionally like that is not as good as looking at it as an, as an, as a multifaceted project where you own the land and, and you have a lot of control over what can be built on it. Um, can you go more vertical? Let's just take the current city hall location. Can you go more vertical with the city hall and leave more land for a private developer to come in and they're willing to help fund it, right? There's different mechanisms in how you try to solve the problem. It's the same thing about going downtown and doing mixed use where these other New Rochelle and other places, look, if, if a 30 story, we're not gonna build a 30 story building downtown, but if there's a, a point where it's worth it for the private developer to go in there and like, yeah, you give us, as your example, Dan, 280 offices, right? In New Rochelle, I think it was, and they were willing to build the garage in the city hall. Well, that's a fantastic example, right? I mean, my gosh. So again, I'm not saying downtown's gonna, you know, but it's it's thinking a little bit more creatively of how we solve the problem rather than just saying, well, let's build a downtown a city hall on its current lot. Let's, I mean, I think really you got to throw things out on the table before you start doing studies saying, well, you know, and, and engaging maybe WRT. Now that's the other thing. Wasn't there some funds that was like a slush fund more or less for other services that we had agreed with WRT? Um, when we did our first ask, I think it was, was it before the precise plan? But I thought there was some extra money in there. Um, and I, we, we added all of those services. Yeah. So it's in their current scope. Okay. So, so I, I just wanted to add that, well, two, two things. One is that I, I think the level of work we're talking about is not something that would be able to be funded out of a, a slush fund or whatever it was within the existing contracts, probably much mm -hmm. more significant than that. And I don't want to throw a number out because I don't know enough and, you know, I'd probably like to talk to WRT first. I mean, we do have yeah. a lot of space. Yeah. I also want to note that for people who haven't seen the presentation that Dan's referring to, um, that's, that's the one I think I did in 2019 with the consultants. We did also explore the value of the existing city hall property. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the different, the north, the middle, and the south, and the lease values for, you know, that the council um, was not interested in selling, but they were interested in 99 year leases. So, so we, we did look at that as well. And we have different values, of course, because, um, you know, a high end value and a low end value, and then it all changed depending on level. We assume it would be for housing at the time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, depending on level of affordable housing you would be doing. And then we, you know, there's also some assumptions that were made regarding uh, just going to the surplus land act process, right? And what that sure. would value the land. So <laughs> yeah. take those numbers with that context. So there's a range, right? And okay. a high end range, a low end range of the value of the land. And then we try to say realistically based on all these constraints and you know, knowing there's neighbors on sites and how high you could go, mm -hmm. this is what we think that land is worth. So we did just, you know, if you're interested or whoever is interested in listening to this, if you look at the presentation, there's, there's some summary and we did look at that value of the existing uh, campus property. Okay, but that, was that just value of land or in terms of what, what the potential uh, partnership of a developer could build is 20, you know, 50, 11 stories, let's say, or something. Assuming redevelop, we, we did not assume 11 stories on that campus. Uh, Rob, I think we worked with planning um, CDD at the time about realistically stepping mm -hmm. down from the existing homes. We have probably some lower, and, and maybe Andrew, if he remembers, it's, it's, it's been over two years now. You I mean, even on El Camino, though, El Camino frontage. Yeah, El Camino, you could that's, go That's higher, what I'm saying. Is but the, other, go, the rest yeah. of the property, we went lower. Yeah, totally. So we yeah. assumed, assumed the value, the property. And we actually looked at both. We looked at value for residential and value for office space. Um, mm -hmm. Determined that office would be way too difficult to accomplish there. Yeah. So we yeah. assume you would have to be residential at different densities, depending where it was located. So, it was, uh, so, so there was some analysis behind those numbers when you see it. Got it. Yeah, got it. I, jumping in if at some oh, point, no, jumping in too much, please let me know. <laughs> no, it's to totally fine because I honestly hadn't been tracking that that whole thing. You know, my brain's on other things. But but again, getting back to the new Rochelle example, um, I mean, it's fascinating to me. And, you know, I think it should, it would be interesting to get WRT, again, finding out 
what it would cost to get their numbers guy, right? And work the, the numbers and the square footage and say, well, you know, do they see that as being something viable? You know, from a, because I, I, I think know. there's, Rob, so I think I'm hearing like two things, right? Yeah. Okay. Real, realistically, I think the big thing is just like a go, no go. Like, I don't think it needs to be a full on blown study. So maybe even no. WRC could just help us understand what some yeah. of the buildings that they already have earmarked in the plan, what their floor plate is. So if it's 20,000 square feet of floor and there's eight floors, there's 160,000 square feet. Yeah. Right. And so then we know, okay, well, that's roughly the size that the building would need to occupy in the downtown. I think that's one, right? Just getting the physical size and understanding to yeah. see if it's something that this task force and community would even be interested in contemplating, you know, using the, the most finite resource we have, which is land, um, to house City Hall versus housing the other structures that we've identified as being needed. I mean, is that something we can ask WRT to just let us know what, I mean, this one has a floor plate of 20, this one has a floor plate of 30 and X, Y, Z, and we can kind of at least assess what that is. Adam, can I ask for a clarification on that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because what I heard is that we're talking about City Hall, not on the city owned properties, but on the privately owned properties, correct? Oh, I'm just, I, I'm just using it. I don't care where it goes in here. No, I, I, I think just visually represent it, representing how much space it would take. No, and the reason I asked for that is because I think the cost changes, right? If you're talking about- I'm, I'm not even to the cost yet, but okay, yeah. got it. Yeah, got yeah. It. I'm just to, because I, I think the, everybody needs to realize how much space it's going to take, right? Because we, we want open space, seating, restaurants, all this other stuff that, you know, is on here, but obviously that all comes at a cost of usually height and density and stuff, maximizing other areas of land. So I think if we're gonna try to repurpose part of, you know, A, B, A, B or D or something, then, you know, what does it physically take up? Does it take up a whole block? Cause I think at that point it might, the community might have a different understanding and, and request. Yeah, so I mean, Adam, it, it seems like, well, one, how would it fit? right? Given some of the volumes that we have. And like, again, if it's over, we're near Liberty Towers, again, forgetting about public private land, just saying, how would it fit? You know, okay. because, and, and in terms of the foot, the plate, right? And the and I, don't want, I don't want any thought put into it other than give me like two or three yeah, examples couple of options things that we already have, yeah. tell me what the floor plate is and height, and we'll extrapolate from there. Because the huge component of this, Dan, is that we're talking about, you know, when, in the example of New Rochelle is there was 282 offices that the developer got as is, you know, that made it worth it for him to do it, right? He, he put City Hall in there, but he, he got that out of it. So it's really a question of, it's not just the City Hall, but it's also, do we, do we, because, you know, do we get, can that be done too as part of the fit, right? It's so... I mean, right, Adam. Well, I mean, my, big, my other. But I think concern. Adam's point is is you, you let's let's have a starting point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and go from there, and then you know from there. See if we want to keep exploring. Exactly. Okay. I, I, I would, just, I, I would ask both. I, I would I would oh, personally okay. just tell them this is what we were. This is the example. Again, at the low point, it's just city hall. This is the square footage we need to house this many people. But as you're looking at everything, this is the new Rochelle example where they, Dan, it would be helpful if you gave the square footage of that, just as in terms of context. It's like that city hall took up X square footage, the 282 offices and what the developer got, was it a two to one ratio? Meaning the developer got two thirds of the building that he needed to make, you know, like, again, you could, you yeah, could. So we're going down, but we're going down well, but, a path of like, you know what Manuel said: private, public, partner. Yeah, 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 but I think we're way uh, right now. We're still. I think we just need to understand it at a go, no go. Especially, you know, well, I'm gonna go back to Manuel's point of, you know, is it on public land or private land? If it's on public land, which are the first A, B, and D um, blocks available, then that could seriously inhibit the catalyst we've all been talking about. Sure. As well. So it depends, that's also yeah. something just to contemplate as you're thinking about this. So I think I think the first step is just to understand 
the volume of what this uh, entity would take up down mm -hmm. here and then understand do we even want to explore it more okay I, I just i hate to add, you know i think it's a simpler answer from them in terms of their you know how they evaluate it and i i honestly think once you ask the one they could probably give you a very uh you know educated answer for yeah. the context of additional but I'll, so, I'll leave it at that. Wait, no, so Rob, wait, elaborate on that. So you're, you're saying well, that- Look, you're once... gonna ask, let, let me just tell you, you're gonna ask WRT, you're gonna say, we need, okay, 280,000 square feet for a city hall. We want you to look at, if you were to put it downtown somewhere, what's the footprint? Like, how does, how does that fit somewhere within our, our current form that we have? And we could say we were thinking here or here, here's one option that's public land or you know whatever. What I'm saying is you already have that dialogue going and then like, well, what else are you thinking? Well, we're thinking, well, you know, again, Dan, if you told them New Rochelle did it and they just doubled the square footage and it made it uh, worth it for the developer to do it. Well, it's just that second question or part to it is like, well, it's 280,000 or 500,000 or whatever it is, you know, and they could say, oh, well, there's no way in hell we're going to get $500,000 on a city block or whatever, you know, within your, mm -hmm. again, it, it might be, a, like you said, Adam, it could be a non, it's, no, it's not going to happen with the forms that we have right now, you know, at least we get that answer, you know, but they and might. I would, I would like to make one additional request to the task force, if you are going to proceed with this, is that one of the key things we were trying to accomplish, and obviously that doesn't have to be a priority, is to get all the office staff in the same building sure. at the same time, right? Because there's a, and, and, and Andrew and Rena and Leslie can tell you that there's a, a, there's a deficiency when we're working in different buildings and separate areas uh, from a pure operational perspective, sure. from working together, from working with developers, um, just day to day, you know, having meetings and just, it, it just created a lot of issues for us. So that's why we were focused on trying to get all 240,000 square feet at the same place so we could be more efficient um, yeah. if we were going to spend money on on a project obviously 240,000 per feet is a lot more than 160,000 especially on these blocks yeah. but uh, that's certainly a concern that that's going to be there as part of the discussion so if, if the task force is going to ask for funding with the council to do this um, if possible i would ask that you also not just look at that 160,000 square foot approach but actually the full need for all city services, right? Because I, I called it the utility building, but really what we're talking about all city services and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and trying to address some of the operational deficiencies we're dealing with today. And for that, we need to be all together, which is- and that, that was 280,000, right? 240,000. So yeah, I just started that. And again- uh, I thought we so. learned how to work remote during COVID. Yeah. I'm kidding, Manuel, sorry. <laughs> no, um, you know, Adam, and you know, honestly, I, I, I mean, that number change. Yeah. Yeah, you could. I, I don't know the answer to it, right? All this analysis was done before COVID, but I don't. I mean, the goal would. I be don't know if you want to go back and redo no. the space analysis. That was a lot of effort, and kind of how that space analysis might change based on what things might look like twenty years from now. We did try to account. We reduce office spaces. We had communal spaces. We did all that as part of the process, just knowing things were changing anyway. But if we wanted to add uh, funds to explore what a COVID, you know, post-COVID building, how it might be decreased, would it be, you know, 200,000 or 220,000 instead of 240,000? We could do that. We just don't have the data right now. Okay. Thanks, Manuel. Um, Leslie, I want to ask one question just to try to put this to bed and move on. So since we, since we do have a bunch of office space designated in the plan, now yeah. um i mean that could be considered for municipal use right so maybe we sure. can ask well how much you know what would one building i think it's important to understand the volume of space but at this point i mean we could just say it's you know earmark it as what we have slated for office right at a later yeah. time i don't want to delay also you know if we're going to run this we could probably run it in parallel then right with the eir and everything since office and municipal are considered the same right yeah, what we're doing in the precise plan would not preclude City Hall from moving downtown because it is an office use and we're planning for an accommodating office use. So, and so I was kind of holding off on this that, that and this was rough math when when Jim and company were were calculating the office space they had at that point. 
I had calculated 3,500 workers based on his per square foot per worker, um, you know, calculation. That that's something I think we could do, you know, Adam, you and I, or, or whoever. But you know, I, I had down 3,500 office workers in, you know, in my um, my calculation. And, you know, we're talking about a hell of a lot less than that. Sorry about my room again, <laughs> Blair Witch. So if, um, you know, if that's the case and we're in a, a, a period where offices are very, you know, then the, in our business right now in, in semiconductors, I'm, I'm sitting in a, uh, you know, there's two of us in this, this place that's got, you know, 450,000 square. So it's going to get constricted and maybe those offices don't get leased. And if you've got a, you know, to your point, if you have this, this office space set and you can fill it and they're all, you know, you've you got your utility building maybe across from, you know, a coffee shop away from, from city hall and the poor guy's got to walk, you know, I don't know, 30 feet and, you know, will that work? Right. Um, or you can do something like then just just to clarify, I mean, we yeah, we're not talking about 30 feet. I mean, if you look at the plan that we well, did, maybe we have something two, like this, we have two buildings well. that were probably 30 feet apart. We're yeah. just trying to get in the same general campus and area right now. We're at the on as Silicon Valley Power, for example, is on Martin Avenue mm -hmm. uh, by Home Depot. So we're so even when we laid out the master plan, it was two different buildings, and and that was driven a lot by the financial realities of what we had money for. So yeah, so being on one on two separate blocks, it w would not be an issue at all. It's uh, it, it's more yeah. like yeah, just just to clarify. And I think that's what they did here is they you know they connected. You know they they just basically utilize the two blocks open the street and that's that's the goal is the grid you know for for our group is is trying to get main street back um and this this might be a great way of doing it and to adam's point you've got you know i'd like to do the calculation of how many workers if we did get the office space the square footage of office that that we're talking about you know how much could city hall even help that in the beginning by filling those spaces that they're going to be abandoned for you know quite a while yeah maybe we can work on getting um some of the questions formulated and get them over to leslie and have a review them and see if um, that's something we can ask wrt just to give us a quick metric of what they have figured office space per square foot for employees how many employees they figure that their current plan has and then versus how the city hall would fit into that you know. Correct. I like that. Yeah, because we have we have a, a base off of square footage and then, you know, that bonus height number of floors that they could get square footage, right? Right. Um, right. So Maybe base we... base plus bonus is somewhere around 670,000 square feet. Perfect. All right, let's do that. It then. might be a little less because that was before we sort of adjusted the heights, but I would assume not too much less. Okay. Well, if I could ask, I mean, going around DCTF, what do you guys think? Silence. <laughs> you guys, we all went to bed. <laughs> yeah. Peter or Rena. You put Rena, me on last. Rena, I'm sorry. Oh, um, yeah. Hey, you guys. This is Rena. Um, I just wanted to, you know, kind of step back a second. And, you know, I've observed downtown San Jose and how it's evolved. And I know Butch was talking to that earlier, too. And, um, I know for us, what we really want to see is a catalyst. And that's where a lot of this is coming from is like, how do we control a catalyst? And when I go back to when people were talking about visions of what they saw for downtown, they talked about really a lot of placemaking and a lot of community benefits that are quite frankly, very hard to finance. You know, I think about things that people want like a, a public market, um, you know, a community room. Um, and some of that stuff I, I understand is just incredibly difficult. Um, and however, they're really valuable to downtown because it makes downtown a destination. And when I think of City Hall, I think of it as a place 
where of course the public may want to be and workers have to work. But when I think of what happens after hours, are those workers going to spill over into the coffee shops and the restaurants and the theater that we're trying to create? Or do we want to focus on those destinations like the theater, the marketplace, the places that people want and try to put our energies into creating those things that are quite frankly, incredibly difficult to bring on um, and put our energies into that. I mean, I, I just, I just sort of see like downtown, I don't know if city hall being, is the catalyst that we want to create the place and the vision that people were talking about. So that was just okay. me kind of stepping back and, and making that general observation. And let me, if I could, if I can answer that. So San Jose, cause I, I went down there. I mean, I looked at that and with all due respect to that city and to the people who've worked on it, I think it's the worst location they could have picked. And they they did exactly what we did with Main Street. They, they killed Fifth Street. They put it on the edge and they had, you know, the city looked like Beirut for, you know, 20, 30 years. And instead of putting it in the center where it originally was when it was that Scottish, you know, beautiful city hall before they tore it down, they put it on the edge. And so no development occurred from there. So I think that's a, a terrible example of, of, you know, I think, you know, you can argue the architecture and I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm saying the place where, where they selected it, I think was incorrect. I think now to answer part two of your question, I think that- hey, Dan, the, can I just clarify? Cause I actually think I incorrectly referenced San Jose. Oh, okay. I, the reason why I referenced San Jose is because I actually think that San Pedro market spurred activity into downtown oh i way agree more than the intention oh of i agree moving downtown city hall to downtown when i no, think I of agree. what was a catalyst but for downtown san jose it was that public market and so i just reference like the same thought process that people wanted city hall and i get that it wasn't well executed but i do realize that the public market was this really important thing that created this catalyst no i agree with that but now to answer part two your question um, a guy coming out of an office, you know, a lawyer, let's say it, it's not city hall, it's a lawyer. He's just as thirsty for a beer as a guy from city hall. Right. I mean, they're, you know, or, or what have you, it's, it's, it's will office workers want to get the heck out of the area they work in or will they stay and, and, you know, either eat breakfast before have lunch during, um, you know, that, that that's you know again that we can go until 11 o'clock at night i i just think it, i hope not yeah me too um but yeah i just think that that what i've heard and again and i i welcome you guys we can get on the phone with these folks that have done it and they're all that's what they're saying to us they're saying it did it so Okay, were there any other task force members? I don't see anyone. You go to the public? We can. All right, let's go to the uh, public. Remind everybody that the chat, unfortunately, is not working. So uh, I see first person, Patricia. Go ahead, Patricia. Hey, y'all, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. New microphone, by the way. Oh, uh, sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so I, I have a lot of concerns about this particular proposal. Um, you know, the if we're talking about like you know, the current, like the catalyst, the current city hall is being too small to accommodate for our current workforce and future projected workforce, then the footprint of this kind of new proposal it kind of necessitate to be a bigger footprint and I worry about how much of uh, how much room is going to take in the downtown area if we were to put it there and even if we put it in like um, kind of like a public private type of setting where it is um, you know just like a regular office space it it kind of locks in the use of those office space for a very long time and it doesn't like allow for like a turnover of those spaces. Um, and if the city hall decides to move again, it vacates a very large part of the footprint of the downtown. It may kill it in the future. So that's uh, a huge concern for me. 
Um, and then Deborah mentioned the, about like the vacated land and we want to think about the full cycle of it. Um, one of the one of the things about the current city hall it actually sits on a parcel that has a uh, <laughs> historically significant Robert Royston design um, uh, landscape like out in front. Um, I, I on the kind of on the historic front consider to be consider it to be protected. Um, and also like we we've seen recently with uh, the El Camino Real plan that there is a very active um, neighborhood over there that very much opposes building high density, like basically across the street over there. So I worry about the feasibility of trying to um, change the usage of that particular parcel. Um, let's see. Um, and then, you know, kind of listening to Manuel and Rina, you know, there's a, a real um, concern from the city hall that, you know, they, they really want to consolidate everybody in the same place. And, you know, I, I actually went to take the um, uh, calendar picture today for HLC. And I, I forget how our interactions are very different when we're all face to face. And I really miss that. So like, I, I don't, I, I personally would discount this whole work remote thing that would decrease the number of people like in, you know, wanting to sit in the same place because like the, the mode of work is very different. So I think, you know, I worry that we're trying to push the city into doing something that we're, they're not ready to do. Um, and then, you know, you know that's that I, I think um, investment by a city you know, to kind of push things forward is a good thing. Um, I think we're too focused on this idea of like doing the city hall. There are other things that we can do, you know, that can incentivize developers. I mean, one of the things I've thought I've tossed around is that we need to do a garage anyway. I mean, we maybe we can do like, a, you know, have the city build a garage and, um, but like have the plan ready and not execute on it until like we have developers committed into building. Um, and kind of execute it at the same time and maybe reduce the parking ratio for those buildings, you know, as an incentive to spur development. You know, we, we can get really, you know, think outside a box on, on how the city can, um, you know, invest in this parcel, like in, in, in these 10 block area to kind of push things to um, go. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like some of my points. You know, I I, I worry that we are going to sink to too much um, time and energy and slush fund, <laughs> if need be, into into trying to investigate in this idea that I think it's very very problematic at the first place. Um, so and and it's definitely for me this is taking energy away from focusing on how we can do the downtown right. Um, and try to fit a square peg in the wrong hole. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, Thank you. Mary Grizzle was next. Go ahead, Mary. You can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, first I'd like to say that there's more than one way to skin a cat. Manuel brought up the cost of building a city hall on city property versus leased property. Uh, a solution to that uh, could be a swap would be perfect between uh, Swinson's property for the city owned property and put his hotel uh, in block A. Um, and as far as City Hall moving, I, we're not advocating that they move. We're advocating that they look at, at all the stats. And all the, as far as every uh, bit of work that I've put into this group and all the calls I've made in, through uh, many cities throughout this country, uh, all the stats show that City Hall should be downtown. That it not only, well, let me say something else. Um, uh, 
the Don't look at me. I can't I can't think of what I want to say. Um, all the stats show that no the city hall downtown makes money. Yeah, uh, that that uh, all the stats show that a city hall downtown makes money for the downtown and spurs growth. Uh, but th th that's not what I wanted to say. I wanted to say something else, and it was important. <laughs> I've had a long day. Um, the city hall, the city hall originally was moved from the downtown and put where it's in its location because the city was planning on building, uh, uh, tearing down all of this part of the old quad where my house is and putting and, and building a downtown that went all the way down to the El Camino, which would make it, <clears throat> which would make it very uh, good for the, for city hall to be where it's at. Right now, having city hall where it's at doesn't make any sense. It's in an area where um, it's all apartments mostly all apartments, and it should be in a public place. Whether it's in, in a public place downtown or somewhere else, it should be in a public place where, where most of the people have access to it, easy access to it. And um, again, I'm very tired and I'm not speaking very well, but I think I got my point across. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate it. Uh, Skip Pearson. Go ahead, Skip. Oh, yeah, I agree with what Mary said originally back in uh, the late 50s. The Warburton uh, property was envisioned to have a city hall because back then and even in the 60s, the idea was that the city was going to expand toward El Camino and eventually Warburton would be downtown. That hasn't happened in 55 years. It probably won't happen in another 55 years. It certainly is not what the old quad wants and it's not what Rod wants. The city hall anywhere in the country is the heart of all downtowns. It's, it's, it's where everyone congregates. It's where the community interacts. It's, it's the heart of the city. And they tore it away back in the... Uh, 60s and, t and took it um, to Warburton for, for what the reasons we were just talking about, which no longer stand true. So City Hall should be brought back and it should be brought back on city owned land. It won't cost any more to build it on City Hall land, um, uh, excuse me, on, on downtown land than it will cost on Warburton. And the Warburton property is much more valuable. It's 10 acres that City Hall is sitting on. That 10 acres is worth maybe 12 to 15 million dollars per acre, not six million like that two uh, two years ago the Smith Group said, where they give where they gave four or five uh, uh, sale comps and they didn't even give the addresses of where those properties were. That's not true. The property is worth 12 to 15 million dollars an acre, and that's 10 acres just where City Hall is sitting, not where the Triton Museum, not where the three acre park is, just on city hall itself. So if the city's looking for money, that's where they can get money. And all that surrounding area around Warburton is apartment houses. It's not single story homes, it's built for multi uh, uh, level living. And it would be perfect for affordable housing. And uh, as Mary pointed out, on Warburton, you don't see any other businesses uh, that are cropped up there in the last 55 years, but you put City Hall downtown, bring it back, and there'll be a slew of activity at all times. And furthermore, to have a huge office building with permanent people there, it's a plus, it's not a minus. 
If City Hall stays there for another hundred years, that's wonderful. That means you won't have a tech company every 10 years taking a, half, a whole block of downtown and then leaving, or the university uh, taking over a whole block um, uh, for itself. These existing seven story building on uh, the Commerce Building on, on the corner of um, uh, Homestead and Lafayette, the, the university already owns, uh, or, excuse me, already rents space on the top two floors so in essence the city's not going to be a landlord they're not going to they're not going to rent out all the office space that is required for any successful downtown they're going to rent it out if they rent it out at all they're going to rent it out to entities like a tech company or the university so city hall employees regardless of whether it's just city hall or city hall and the utilities that's wonderful that's fantastic Fantastic. Those are the best possible tenants that you could possibly get in any building. And it is absolutely necessary to have a huge number of office space in any successful downtown. So um, it certainly should be investigated. And um, as far as um, uh, the, 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 how much space it would take up, as Manuel said, the uh, Manuel said the he thought that the existing seven-story commerce building at the corner of Lafayette and Homestead was ninety thousand square feet. Well, just envision that. If you got one hundred and sixty thousand square feet, then you've got roughly two times that. So you build a building that's twice as high next door, or you uh, you duplicate that building and uh, side uh, right beside it, and you've got enough for city hall. If you want to add another um, 80,000, I don't know why it's necessary to have utilities close to a city hall. I don't understand that rationale, but if you want to have that, there's plenty of room there for that also. So that's not a, that none of those are problems. And the advantages are so extreme that it definitely should be investigated because the city paid almost two bill $2 million two years ago for that Smith Group study. And the Smith Group didn't even analyze whether City Hall, when rebuilt, should be rebuilt downtown. They never analyzed it. They weren't told to analyze it and they didn't analyze it. And that's something that should be analyzed. And we've got WRT now that's ready to do it Ask them, find out, and get it. Get them on it. It's 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 all plus. I'm done with my rant. Okay. Thank thanks. you, Skip. Thank you, Skip. Uh, Thank you. Don, Donna West. Let's um, please. go ahead, Donna. Hi. I'll keep mine very short, but I'm tagging on to Skip to try to summarize what he was trying to say. We have ready-made employees. We have a city that's 150 years old or longer, the city's not going to go anywhere. They're not going to disappear. You know, we've got a city, we've got city employees, we have space, we have buildings that we're building. You know, let's connect these parts. This is the universe talking. We've got a transit oriented destination near BART. We have everything. We've got the employees, the buildings, you know, and we, you know, let's connect the developers to the public interests and ask WRT just to add on. And remember, City Hall, City Hall is the people place. It's not a place where employees go and work. It's 120k and increasing population of Santa Clara and City Hall is our building. We can put Deborah's art, we can put um, events that Anna's planning. Let's connect all these dots that we studied and build a create, you know, together in this building. Um, it's going to be fabulous. 
uh, you know, you can have the art gallery, you can have everything else, and the city employees will probably enjoy it. <laughs> you know, so remember, it's a people place. It's a, a people building. It's a public building. Um, you know, let's put it in a place by that transit oriented and you have people living above it for Matthew, you know, so let's connect all these dots and do it. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Donna. Donna. Um, I see uh, Connie, one more hand. Connie Connie. Connie. Yep. Go ahead, Connie. And I have uh, something, a little something to read. And it says, come on, give it up. Ooh, there's a lot of feedback, Tony. Hey, turn that thing up. Lisa Gilmore's father, Gary Gilmore, wanted the um, the, uh, the city hall downtown. I got it all. And he realized the mistake back in the 70s. And um, I wish I wish they would have let him have his way by putting it back. But it was Lisa Gilmore father that said we made a mistake and we need to bring it back that's what i wanted to say thank you tony you're welcome thank you tony go ahead jonathan uh, sorry clicking on the wrong line hold on there we go go ahead jonathan oh it looks no? like you permitted Bob. Oh, is this coming through? There we go. Awesome. Okay. So uh, I want to say that I understand and appreciate that, you know, the city really needs to show that it's, you know, behind um, this plan and, you know, can get some things going. But I, I don't think I agree that downtown is the right place to put a city hall. Um, it takes up a lot of the area. And I can look at examples um, I've seen even more recently about places where city halls are kind of in a downtown or an area. And they tend to not be all that activated. You know, Atescadero, California has this grand city hall building. It's a gorgeous park, but there's nothing around there. The downtown, there's no activity. Um, it's not not bringing any life to that area. Um, I was down there on a, on a weekday yeah, in the afternoon, um, not that long ago, and it was just, just dead. Um, another example is like even like by San Jose, you know, they put the big city hall, they moved it to downtown, and you know, the San Jose city hall, as nice as the building is, is not, the most activated, you know, part of downtown. The part where you want to be is, you know, further in by San Pedro Square, and that's kind of where everything's happening. And that's that's not city hall area. So, I appreciate the excitement behind doing this. Um, it it just seems like a not a best use of the, the valuable space we have in our downtown. Um, I'd like to see like more like a business tenant or something where you know I think there'll be just more activity. Um, as much as I do go to see hall meetings, I, I don't know that um, that many other people. Um, do it's generally people just kind of go in and out for things like permits and such and it's a probably a good office space for the, the people but we need to make sure we have space for the city to collaborate so yeah i don't i don't not not a huge fan of this plan and uh would like to see uh you know something else done with the downtown thanks thanks jonathan uh any thanks, other like any other community members in the public want to speak the ones all right, we'll close public's comment on this. Um, are there any final comments from any of the DCTF members before we close and adjourn the meeting? Oh, 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 oh. Can you hear me? Great back yeah. background. Okay, wait, hold it. Leslie, what am I doing? I don't know. What are you trying to do? <laughs> Good God. Are you are you trying to stop sharing? Yeah, let's stop sharing. sharing. There, there we go. go. There you go. All right. So, where are we at? Are we not going? Are we? Do we want to bring this up? Do we not want to bring it up? What do we want to do? 
So your last slide was asking if the, the DCTF wanted to, as a um, body, bring this up to the council. But. So, well, Dan, do you want to try to formulate um, some specific questions for WRT to see if we can just get some high level go, no go answers and then see at the next meeting if we want to proceed and go ask for either funding or, you know, direction on if, if we need to do a study before we, we spend that time. Okay. And what would we be asking WRT? Well, so the for, how big the format and the foot plate would be, right, in comparison to what we have already accounted for, and how much unique traffic this downtown would be bring to, or the city hall would bring if it was placed in downtown versus what we already have in the mix of housing and office space uh, in the precise plan. And how would they, would they do that for free or would we slush fund that or how would we do that? It would not be for free. Um, well, they could tell us, they could tell us their assumptions of the development capacity. Uh, the foot traffic would be something new. Okay. Can I just, uh, um, I've had my hand up for a bit. I just want to make sure I understand. Dan, are you looking for a motion tonight to move forward or you're just going to come back at the next meeting and ask for something more specific? What I was hoping for is that we could open this up to council to go to council on behalf of DCTF and ask them to start investigating um, the feasibility of something like this. That was my, our intention. So that would take a motion, wouldn't it? Where we would yep. all have to agree to take it to the city council? Correct. And it could be a light, you know, a light question as far as, uh, um, you know, could we look into this as far as, um, you know, the feasibility of it? Um, and I don't have my, my okay. screen up. Dan, can I can I make a recommendation if that's okay? Sure, sure. So I I think I you know uh, I honestly think we need to flesh everything out, right? I would suggest before you go to council, we ask WRT generally this is what the down, what the task force would like to look at. I would ask them not to give us an exact scope or number, but just a general range of cost of what we think something like this could cost. And then we bring that back to the next meeting and then the task force can make a determination if they'd like to make that request to council. Um, and I think uh, Leslie and, you know, and I'm happy to join in that meeting just because of my previous work, but it would be, you know, just taking all existing information, right? Something to the effect, um, analyze how a 160,000 square foot or 240,000 square foot city hall would lay out um, what kind of benefits, if they can analyze what kind of benefits it could provide. And then separate from that, because I think this is a huge, huge effort and I don't wanna increase the number too much, right? But depending on what, if you wanna look at funding options, including private, private, public, it's late at night, public, private partnerships, how much would like something like that would cost. And I, I'm not, I would, I would have a conversation that I'm not gonna hold them to that number. I'm gonna ask him to give me a range and be conservative on the higher side because I don't wanna spend a lot of, my, of our money. Them to let, them, but that will give you a little more information of the request you would make for council. That's kind of my perspective, but obviously you don't have to do that. You can just make the request, but I, you know, whenever I go to council for a contract amendment, I'd like to generally have an idea of how much it's gonna cost um, especially for general fund money, because uh, as you know, there's a lot of requests on that. So that's a thought. Uh, and I said, uh, I don't know, I think, you know, if we have that conversation with WRT, hopefully, you know, if, if it's just even that is too much, too expensive to do, we can always come back and, and talk to you about it. But I would just see very high level. Are we talking 50,000 or are we, you know, I'm going to throw two big numbers. So no, are we talking 50,000 or are we talking 500,000, right? Just, just to give us a range of what they You're think. You're just looking for a ROM for services, right? Rough order of magnitude. Rough order of magnitude. That way, when, if, if, if you want to make this request to council, um, 
once they fund it, we can flesh out a scope uh, that fits within that cost. But I think generally what you're looking for is you want to explore moving City Hall downtown um, based uh, within the current plan, not limited by ownership. It can be private land or, or public land. Uh, and what kind of floor plates and square footage it would require based on the previous study that was completed. Separate from that, um, how much do you think it cost a, a scope of work would cost to do a public private partnership? And I would start that off by saying, you know, if you're looking for, you know, $300 million or $200 million, what kind of uh, development would you have to have to be able to get $200 million out of it on top of everything else they have to spend in their profit. But I would make that part two because I think your scope gets too big and too expensive at that point. I was, I think Adam was saying that I would start with the first step and then the second step could come later. But I would like, to, I generally would like to have a conversation with them just to have a range of number. If I'd that like that. With the task force. I'd be okay with that. So when would we do that? Because the, the, the problem is that we got Christmas coming up and... Well, I'm out of town for two weeks. Scoping document, right? We can send you a scoping list of questions and ask them to provide us a ROM to complete certain services and breakouts. So I can help you with that, Dan. You, okay. you and I can figure and draft something up, get it over to Leslie, and then they could probably get us a cost back or ROM back, I should say, because it's not going to be exactly specific. We'll have to define it um, by the next DCTF meeting. They should be able to ROM something pretty quick. I think that could be workable. And Leslie, you know, if, if we run into any concerns or issues just because the work effort is too much to do this, right? Uh, you know, then we can probably send an email to the task force and let you know, um, and then you can reconsider your options at that point. Okay. Does that yes. sure. All right? Okay. I just wanted to throw that out there if it, if it makes sense for the group. Otherwise, we can do anything else, uh, anything different than the task the task force votes on. Good suggestion, man. Well, thank you. Yeah, I like it. All right, I don't see any other DCTF members' hands. So Dan, you and I'll we'll figure out a time and we'll get something over to Leslie um, as early as possible. Okay, and before we go, I wanna thank everybody who helped on the reclaiming our downtown side for all those 5 a.m. calls, all those obscure cities. <laughs> I appreciate it and we'll get there. I appreciate all that work too. I know that um, you know you have all put a lot of. Uh oh. Uh -oh. oh we lost to Deborah. Yeah. I think she was saying you're great. So. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I'm I not. That no, wasn't me. Well, well, me, we're in was, the moment. I, I, was I six of us. I just yeah, want to say I. were all compliments. I, 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 I heard it on my end. You, you all couldn't hear it. Good. Let me just say I've been in, in seven public meetings in the last two weeks in which I spent hours and hours and hours listening to people say no. And, um, you know, this group is working hard to get to yes, and it's a pleasure. So I really appreciate that and the time. I do too. And thank you, Dan. Yeah. And I meant what I said in the beginning. Thank you, guys. It's like 27 meetings. And Leslie and Manuel. And, no, but we've had the communities. Oh, you. And, well, yeah, all of us. Yeah. I yeah. stopped counting. All right. Yeah. Well, you, uh, I mean, you stopped motion. after 20. There's Is one it? more item on the agenda. Uh, oh, no. So sorry, public presentations. Oh, you're right. Sorry, public presentations. Is there anyone in the public that would like to present or to speak on an item that was not on this agenda? See, no one. No one. All right. We'll close uh, public presentations. And is there a motion to adjourn the meeting of November 18, 2021? And I just want to say for before we adjourn, there were no mistakes in the script. It happened. Great job, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it you. only took 23 meetings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, moved, so moved on the motion. Right, hold on, I want to give Leslie a thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm giving you two thumbs up too, Leslie. Just my Thank camera doesn't work because you. You. You, you never enabled it. it. You could just do it, yeah. It was difficult. It really was. All right, thank. All right, so, was there a second? I'm I sorry. Got a butch first. Second. Uh, second. Uh, Rob second. Rob second. All right, all in favor in adjourning tonight's meeting, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. 
All right, the eyes carry. Thank you to the public and staff and everybody hung in there with us. We really appreciate it. Have a great holiday and uh, we'll see you in December. Happy Take Thanksgiving. Care. Care, Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Turkey Day. Happy Thanksgiving. Be safe.